everyone to the resumption of these hearings. Apologies for late start. And our first uh, submitter is Mr McGowan. Welcome, Dougal. like to uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak again today, uh, to represent uh, the views of our members uh, and the thousand businesses that uh, are our members. Uh, we'd like to continue to thank the Council for their open dialogue with us, um, and in particular for um, being accommodating and hosting or being part of a business forum, uh, which looked at the issues, and we thank uh, Deputy Mayor Chris Staines for attending. Uh, ELT member Sandy Graham, two council members, uh, Geary and is Mr Wiley here? He's not here at the moment. Mr Wiley was there and also senior uh, uh, economic staff that were there as well. So that was great um, for business to be able to have a focus and to be able to have their questions answered directly. Um, I suppose it's a part of this will be up to you how you'd like me to do this. We can go through each section. You've, you've had the report and you've read it. Whether you want to go through each section or you want to do the whole lot all at once and then come back uh, and answer those questions as we go through. Well, my suggestion is that you just make your main points briefly because the, the submission has been read and then we can go into questions. Yeah, great. So um, if we look at the bridge, um, there is a, a very strong support, 70 per cent, uh, for a, a bridge development. Uh, and of that, though, that there is a bit of a mixed bag after that of those who want to have the bridge, uh, is that 58 per cent would like the architectural design. Um, but when you combine basic design and those that want neither, that comes to approximately 42 per cent as well. So uh, the mandate isn't quite so strong for the architectural, but it is there. Um, to be seen, but we need to be aware of those basic design and neither as a, as a, as a group together. Um, so we do support that uh, and, uh, and what that means for the city moving forward. Uh, equally with the main uh, city centre upgrade, again uh, a strong mandate of 83% would like to see that upgrade happen. Uh, however, again of those that support it, uh, it is quite a mixed spread of whether they'd like the substantial investment or the moderate investment in there. Um, but there is a pretty, there is that overwhelming support to say yes, we need to do something. Uh, but there might need to be more consultation and information about what that's going to look like and how that's going to be managed. And probably an education piece. And we know it's really early in the time piece for everybody. But I think that education and understanding piece is going to be vital to the success and the buy-in of those in involved. Uh, just an, a, a wee aside there, uh, recently there have been talks in the newspaper around changes to the Octagon and Lower Stewart Street. Uh, we would encourage further engagement and consultation uh, before plans are developed on any of that uh, and, and to make sure that we involve business and retail in that process as well as the public. Um, <coughs> we go to the tertiary precinct, again there is uh, strong support uh, for an upgrade of that, 60, just under 60%. Uh, but Again, those who w were for that were divided between a substantial and moderate investment, with more favouring the moderate investment there by approximately 50%. Um, but there were a number of comments there, and some of these come from probably a lack of understanding and acknowledging of the funding that sits in behind it, um, and that is some of the clarity around what is the universities and the polytechs contribution to those um, developments, um, and that may be something that you might want to think about internally about how you talk about those things. The rates increases, uh, again, there was uh, people seem to be supportive of that at 54%. Uh, however, um, there were quite a large number of no's there at 30%, and then there's the unsures. One thing that came through quite strongly was um, that people don't really understand the ratings process and how that works and how that comes together. Um, and what that actually means for them is a dollar cents when they get their bill. Um, and so, uh, again, there could be some, some interesting education pieces that goes into that, and we know that there are additional supports that have been there. I don't have the figures um, from uh, 2017 to 18 uh, of what the actual rates take is, but if we take the increase from 
2019 through to 2021. Uh, over those three years, there's actually a rates increase of uh, $25 million collected by Council, which equals 14.72% just on those three years and doesn't take into account what it is from this year to next year. So uh, I think that needs to be uh, thought about. Uh, it's quite a large figure that hits, hits in there for, for many people and where that's distributed. So there is an education piece about that. There's also some concerns about ongoing long-term um, uh, I suppose uh, costs that are associated with many of the um, plans, uh, for example the cycleway potentially on Portobello with rising sea levels and we know that there is a lot of erosion so you're going to have to have quite a high maintenance aspect to that. Equally with the Main Street redevelopment I think there's two million a year put aside for maintenance and the bridge and things like that so there's an ongoing um, tax burden that is being put on people for those larger projects and we need to understand what that's going to look like not just year one, two and three but what it's going to look like 10 to 20 years down the track as we continue to add projects to that long term <coughs> rates burden. A um, couple of other issues that, that came through very strongly uh, for us as a signatory to Predator Free Initiative, a lot of people very supportive of future and ongoing funding for them at 61%. Uh, and again, uh, that, pred that predator free group has some work to do around education about what they do and the benefit for the city. Um, place based groups, uh, we support that in principle, um, but what definitely came through is that people didn't know really much about what that actually meant and how that would add value. So I think um, we'd be willing to help and support that to make that happen, but with 50% saying at this stage, um, yes, I'd support that. I think that's a positive step. And then with the future education, that I think that those numbers would probably go up along the way. So there's a bit of work there. Interesting, looking at the selling of the assets, um, we generally support the sale of assets to fund some of the development, but there were some reservations from some. Um, and again, that will probably sit in the detail that sits behind which um, uh, the types of assets and those sorts of things, which many people don't have access to that information or don't dig or haven't got the time to dig enough deeply into that. Um, but again, I think that there, there could be some more discussion around that. Um, there are other comments, uh, other, other areas that people would like to support or think are, are worthwhile projects which are <coughs> outside of the funding. That is the Mosgiel Pool. Uh, that needed to be thought about. Uh, Logan Park development has been on the agenda for a long, long period of time and there's a strong support for um, something to happen there. A continued support for cycleways um, to continue some of that development and what that's going to look like for the city. More work on the destination plan and potentially funding there. Uh, support to um, bring in new businesses. Um, and we also know that there's a couple of reviews going on internally within council. Um, and if those reviews came up where they needed extra funding, do we have a provision within what we have there to actually fund those changes that may need happening there, uh, like increased staffing or marketing budgets or things like that that sit outside of um, that sit outside of what we're consulting on at the moment. We've also put some information there uh, specifically from our energy committee. Uh, that's around the, the futures of the city and things to consider. And that's around preparing for that coastal change report, uh, which is which has already been tabled here, I understand. Um, but also the carbon zero economy, uh, we're keen to uh, support that and how we can, uh, but also uh, how we're treating organic waste within the city um, uh, as part of the future, but also the district heating plan. Uh, and we know that there are imminent conversations happening around those to do with the hospital and the university. Um, but other than that, uh, I will be more than willing to take questions. Um, but again, we thank Council, ELT and the staff for um, their ability to work with us on many of these projects and, and helping our understanding uh, for our members. Thank you, Dougal. And thank you for um, the, the, the work you do in surveying your members and bringing it to us in a digestible uh, form. A couple of um, questions to kick off. Um, you mentioned, you alluded a couple of times to the possibility that uh, your members may not have understood um, the, the, whether it's the rating system or whether it's the implications of what the university and the Polytech contribute or a number of things. I guess, um, is it of concern that the business community is acknowledged to uh, lack that understanding? Because uh, that's the community we would expect to 
uh, understand financial uh, issues perhaps better than the rest of the community. Yeah, so I don't think that, um, uh, I suppose it's from the, 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 uh, the, ver the written feedback that we have got that we have decided that we don't think that some businesses may not have the information required. We're not saying that they all don't know all that, but we think that we could probably all together do better with that. Businesses are, are busy, as everybody is, um, and I suppose it would be typical of our whole community of do, does our, it's not just business that may not understand the rating, it's our whole community that may not understand our ratings process. So I don't think um, that it's just specific to business, I think it could be an education piece that we could all do right across the sector. Uh, we've worked really hard and we've continued to look at ways in which we can engage more uh, with businesses, with council process. I think we're doing better than what we have. I think we have got more engagement with the support we have from both sides and I think that will only get better and as that takes time over the next three to five years, I think everybody's understanding will improve. Okay. Well, well just following up on that, um, I note that in your um, general comments about the long-term plan, the last one is about new business. and. Is there a plan to attract business such as IT to Dunedin and Enterprise? Dunedin seems to have that task, but has it been effective? Yeah. And I guess the question then of business is, is does, do you think your business members understand the difference between investing in making the city more attractive yeah. and just marketing? Because um, it seems to me that over the last few years, Council has made a point of emphasising that the way, to, the way that we think we need to attract businesses and jobs and people to the city is not by just putting a few ads in the Herald, it's actually making the place attractive enough to, to make it, you know, the sort of place that people want to come to. Yeah. Do you think that your members understand that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one, of the, one of the things that comes through quite strongly in the conversations that we regularly have across the various forums is uh, the skill shortage issue and the how that starting now is the housing. And as I said at our business group one the other day, three years ago, we wouldn't have been talking about housing as an issue in Dunedin, and isn't it? Um, in some ways, even though we have to deal with it, it's a, it's a nice issue to have moving forward that we're actually showing that that is something there. So there's a positive there, but it's kept away with a negative. So we, they are very aware about what it needs to bring good quality people to the city, and as such then also the businesses that may come with them. Because they may be employing somebody to do a job, but they, they may have a partner that is bringing their business at the same time. So they're really aware of that and what is needed to make sure that the environment is well suited to not only the person with the job, but for the people who are coming with them. And that's really important. So those would be the businesses that would support the city investing in making the place attractive? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. I think that comes through quite strongly with, the, with all of the submissions that are here, is that this is a future-focused 10-year um, plan, and it is about providing the city with the next stage to its future development, which is about growing the GDP, bringing more people, more jobs, more security to our city, but while still making it a livable city and one which we sure. all enjoy being part of. Right, thanks. Councillor Benson Park. Thank you, Your Worship. It really follows on from that. I noticed in your survey one of the comments was about uh, the city, uh, sh the city shouldn't be investing in non-productive assets. And, uh, and following on from that, I, I, I would assume that while it may not be directly productive, work in the Octagon or George Street or the Steamer Basin or wherever it might be, the campus, are all things that are pretty substantial improvements of our physical mm. environment that attract people. Would that be the general view of your members? You yeah, look, I think it came through quite strongly, particularly around the Main Street redevelopment that uh, many people felt, um, whether it was business or whether it was from a personal experience, that it needed some work done on the Main Street to make it more attractive and so that people would come in. You know, we've got a, a large number of visitors, both domestic and, and international, that come and visit our city, whether that's for work or whether it's for um, for tourism or whatever, so there's a large number, we want to make sure that that is as attractive as possible so that they come back again, not just once, but on many occasions. So um, would it be fair to assume that most of your sort of central city business, but retailers in particular, do see the connection between good urban design and good 
physical environment pleasant, accessible and so on for the success of their operations. So we haven't broken this survey down into those micro okay. sets, okay. Um, but we do have a retail committee uh, that sits there and they have, uh, as the staff will know here, they have at, this mo at the moment they talk to their other shops around them and there is a feeling for a need that there needs to be work done in that area. Thank you. Uh, and also under the ground, of course, with the piping we are aware of. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Worship. Um, thank you, Dougal, for your submission. I just wanted to clarify with you around the education and engagement. Mm. Did you feel that the ways that we engaged this year were, I don't know how they varied from previously, but um, were they useful? I mean, we came to the Chamber several times mm. in different ways. Mm. Um, can you just talk to us about that and perhaps what we might add in, in future? Yeah, it's, uh, it's always a, a difficult one in the fact that um, you can reach out to people, uh, but they also have to reach out to you. So it's a two-way street, um, and that's always really difficult. And quite often, a, as we know, for, for some, they don't actually have a reaction until after it's happened. Um, that's why we're trying to work more productively looking forward to making sure that people are in the right place at the right time to understand what we're trying to do and the vision uh, really is what we're talking about. Um, I think uh, the time frame, and, and I have to caveat this, that we sit across five different councils and at the same time we have tax consultations going on and, and others as well. It's a very busy time and the fact that the number of working days we actually have to survey, get that out to people, get it back and then get it to, in a format that is useful to you uh, and to us is quite tight. Uh, I understand you're under constraints as well around that time frame, but it is very tight um, in, that, in the fact that you've got Easter and all those things over that time frame, school holidays where people take breaks and they're not there. We know the bounce rate was higher for uh, a one of the surveys we've done, not this one, because it was done during the holidays and people are away with their kids. So there's some things here I think that we can continually tweak. I think the fact that we've gone out and tried to talk to individual groups and have that more available in a less um, formal setting has probably been uh, liked by some. Councillor Lord. Yeah, Dougal, I was just thinking, uh, it's in with people opposed to the budget, it says the proposed bridge is too grandiose and out of character if the harbourside development ever proceeds. Obviously that was one person's view, but yes. would you have any um, views about perhaps whether we should tie the building of a bridge with perhaps consents and work and activity starting on the harbour side before you build the bridge or um, would that make you feel comfortable if there was sale of land and things started to happen down there mm. and then the bridge could proceed because I'm assuming it would take no longer to build a bridge than a hotel for example so yeah. would that make you feel better perhaps? Um, I, I think what uh, I suppose the comments there so we got a, a really high number of comments from our members uh, higher than usual uh, we've just selected one or two that show those poles quite often, as well as the not so sures in the middle. Um, look, I think um, we, we know that people are really engaged in this as an issue. Uh, that's seen through social media, but also the meetings that we've had. I think if we continue that process and there's a greater understanding and people can see how that jigsaw gets put together, because it's not just about what happens down there, it's how we, oh, sorry, how we connect to down there and then what happens to that surrounding area, I think that um, that greater understanding, as we're starting to do, will add value to that. Yeah. Councillor Mabby. Dougal, thanks for your presentation. I'm looking at the um, comments on the around the rates rises, and in the support one it says so long as it's well spent and then that we get go out and maybe get some central government and business come to the party. Um, what would your members think about um, a targeted rate for businesses that are um, getting benefit from some of the upgrades, let's say George Street and I? I wouldn't want to comment on that because I haven't asked them. So okay. I don't know what they'd feel. And so the same thing again for the tertiary precinct, but obviously you can't speak for them. I can't speak for them. Um, and then on the opposed side, I noticed that almost all the comments seem to be around residential rates. Um, did you get much feedback on commercial rates? Uh, we, we got some. We, I, I must admit it, uh, that we don't have a large number of our members are the commercial property owners, so that probably sways some of that. It's probably more the reaction to what that would look like for some. 
Um, also, when we're talking about some of the residential things, because a building might be 13 storeys high, that they are only a proportion of that rates rise of what their square footage should be, and people don't know what that's going to look like um, straight away. So it's quite a complex calculation that'll actually happen for some of those workplaces. Okay, thanks. No more questions? Oh, Councillor Laufey, sorry. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Mr McGowan, for your uh, presentation. I'm just asking about your um, energy committee. I'm, I'm very ignorant about the structure of the chamber, so um, can you just say generally who's on your energy committee? And you talk in the submission about uh, advocating for a strong a partnership um, you know, with key organisations in the city. Are you asking, is the Chamber Energy Committee asking to be part of that partnership? Uh, we're, we're already doing that at the moment, um, and uh, we just want the work to be continued and to have good leverage for that. So we have a wide range of uh, groups that are, are part of our Energy Committee, uh, including members of staff from Council, uh, including the hospital, uh, the university, Polytech, uh, Pioneer Energy. Um, but one of the things that's quite strong there is working in conjunction with the Energy Leaders Accord, which comes out of the plan that we have here to um, make this, a, again, a future focus city. Mr McGowan, thank you very much for your submission. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Ms Howard. And Ms Bear. Welcome again, Maureen. <laughs> and um, you're representing, with this submission, the Delmore Reserve Community Garden. That's right. Far away. Thank you very much uh, for allowing us to submit to this was a, a 10 year submission process. Um, as you know, I've been away for uh, just over two years. And uh, when I first went away, there was no gardens. I live right opposite the Dalmore Reserve Community Gardens. There was just an embankment, nothing. And uh, so coming back, it was a really wonderful thing, you know, to see um, uh, in opposition to the weeds in my own garden. And it allowed me to immediately get involved and start growing my own food. So uh, we'd just like to show a few photos of the change, very briefly, of what's happened. So it's this a bit is old school, but I did this. But this, for example, was the reserve, which, um, as it was. So it's a really quite a large piece of land. It's, be it's beautiful. It's got an amazing view on a very windy site. But that was the view. And um, so this is the view now that Maureen came home to. So this is after a couple of years. So it's, we made a very definite commitment that that front visual garden, which we call the bee garden, because we have a lot of flowers and herbs and stuff like that, so that when people walk past, it instantly looks gorgeous. And you, what, you'll be weeding and you'll see them smile. I mean, it's been a real spirit lifter in that whole area. I mean, again, that was, there's Kelly who started the whole thing. That was the reserve. So it has had a beautiful visual impact and we get a lot of great feedback. So that's yeah. just giving you an idea, we'll leave these with you, but an idea of the changes which you'll remember when you dug, put in the plant the first. Right, yes. I yeah. can't take too much of a credit. No, no, you can't. <laughs> one small, I won't tell you what one small polyantha as I recall. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, beyond the benefits to, uh, there are many benefits that community gardens, we'd just like to speak a couple of minutes to the benefits of community gardens because it can seem quite a humble thing but it actually brings many um, uh, benefits. You know, and one thing is that the um, real estate agents have started advertising. Yeah. We notice, I mean, you know, it creates a dialogue. It's a big part. Apart from the interaction you get with your community, it suddenly becomes something. Um, and there are, there are lots of other benefits which we could talk to, but it was amazing. I think I sent Rachel a picture saying, we're, you know, someone had actually put as part of a selling feature of our neighbourhood that it's close to the community garden. So I felt that was a really nice nod to all our work, which is substantial, so it's yeah. great. And we're also in a low decile area, so we think, believe that the, the gardens is even more important for, in terms of that, in terms of reskilling the community, getting people involved, and um, we've even had involvement with uh, Syrian families who've come along. And mm. yeah. yeah. So, uh, so we're moving on now, so we also, the Community gardens, we believe that it's within the Dunedin City Council's plan, within the energy plan under food resilience, to support um, communities to grow their own food, and community gardens are an ideal way to do this, and to provide access, increased access information 
um, that will um, and resources to enable uh, residents to grow their own food. So, in light of that, um, we ask the council to perhaps review the process and perhaps talk to community garden people who are running community gardens and find out what are the barriers and in what ways the council could could do their bit. It may not always be relevant, but to remove those barriers. And there's one of them that we've identified in particular. And that's, yeah, um, each we have a, a, a license agreement with the council, which, um, with, including GST, is a, a sum of $325 per year, which we have to find to pay, um, which is, is a lot of money for us. I mean, we don't have membership fees. We put a lot of time and money in it anyway for ourselves. That's the reality. Um, and so that's, for our garden, has been quite substantial um, as a is a real negative to each year to have to try and find computers for example the northeast valley garden uh, are lucky they've got a ten dollar a year peppercorn rent with the ministry of education different situation um and um but it is something that is quite serious for us and um and it will be for other groups too depending on how how mm. how, the, how the, that is managed yes yeah, so we just actually had a donation from an individual the local who church just decided yeah. you know yeah. that he, he wanted to support us yeah so know, that so. will hopefully get us through this year but each year i mean we're trying to raise funds on top for <laughs> we got to share we've had great support from community volunteers bunnings the project are amazing you know lots of groups are involved but there's only so much you can do I and mean, really we the any available funds goes for plants and other things until we can get to stage that we can collect seed and do that. I mean, it's, it takes time to build a garden, so we're really grateful for what we've had, but that would make a difference. Yes. So um, moving on, uh, we would also hope that, and I mentioned it yesterday in my submission in transition for Transition Valley, that we were hoping that um, the council could provide something online. And I was thinking about what you said, uh, uh, Councillor Hawkins, about um, you know putting it on Google, you know, and having. Uh, perhaps we could do having a, having all of those uh, community gardens and community fruit, fruit, fruit orchards there for people to see and so that you click on one and you can get the information about that garden mm. yeah, and how people can get involved with that. Mm. Well South have got something similar to that, it's a food, a food map that I don't know if you've seen that site they have on their website so more, it's quite amazing when you look at what's around and initiatives that are, are there to provide cheaper food access for people. Mm. So yeah. Um, oh, <laughs> so moving on to our final request which was a walkway and um, this would really connect the communities of Dalmore which is just below Liberton and Liberton and allow people to access the garden coming up from and it's just it's actually a paper roadway so the provision is there perhaps to make that into a pedestrian walkway so that people could come up and it would also encourage the students at Aquinas to be able to come up the hill. I used to go down that way but now it's become really difficult to it get is, down yeah. but I used to when I first moved it's in. It's very I used overgrown to a lot down. of blackberry and stuff so mm. yeah. <coughs> and people use a lot. Sorry. Liberty. 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 So, so Liberty. Gladstone Road Liberty. so yeah, it goes down the reserve to Gladstone Road, so it links it up from the top of Pine Hall yeah, down. Yeah. Oh, right, okay. Yes, so those are our main points. Have you anything else you'd like to add, Lynn? Um, no, I don't think so. I, I, there probably will be um, questions. But I suppose the one thing I will say is when you're there and you're weeding, the impact on the community, I can't give you numbers involved. I had a kid from Papamoa who's doing a year 11 student ask me, what are the numbers involved with your garden? You know, how many visitors do you get? We, I don't know. You know. We're all volunteers. I work full time up at Otago Boys. I, I'm not sure who's there in the day. Every time I weed though, and I'm there at the working bees, um, people come. Uh, you can tell that they're involved. You'll meet them say, oh, it's looking great. And they talk about how their beans were. It is such an amazing presence, this little garden, it, 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 is, it is something in the community. And I think it makes people feel safe. We're getting a lot more people walking their dogs through because it's cared for. We even had one act of vandalism, theft, no one, you know, because we sort of thought things would happen because it's, you know, we're in an urban place. And, um, you know, so you've got our wee shed down the, which is just in behind there. Nothing, nothing. It is cared for. The kids come in and play. I've got a gorgeous, but we girls next door, the neighbours come. Um, and ask, there's a, a woman next door, Bonnie, who's a mother on her own with three kids, and her wee kids come over all the time, and there's Mania playing, and they help clear away all the old cornflowers which had come up and seeded, and then she brought over, we take her, so beaten bits like that, she's got a little baby, so she can't do a lot. 
She gave us her, her potatoes, we've grown them. She checked if the garlic she could eat it. She's tried broad beans for the first time. That's the magic that happens. I can't, that's what I can't, you know, that's what it does. And it is magic and it's little and wonderful. Okay. You happy thank to take questions? Thank you, yes. Councillor Wilson. Uh, thank you. Um, is your area fenced off? I'm sorry, no. I haven't read. No. no. So, so it's, a, it's totally public? Mm -hmm. Totally public. Now, will you give a comparison with a rugby club, I think, um, having right. to pay. Um, it's a tennis club. Oh, tennis club. But the difference is tennis club, club, I presume, that the council on top of that mows or do they? They mow our lawn. They do a beautiful job. Yeah. So you, you get the yeah. mowing, but they just don't have to the mow. Outside. Yeah, just, just around, around the outside. It's clearly marked. We've got and they do a really yeah. nice job. They look after it really well. Okay. So they like it. Yeah, fine. I can, I can understand that. Okay, no, that's cool. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, thank you, Worship. Thanks, Maureen. Thanks, Lynn. Um, my question, a, a lot of the stuff that you're asking for is kind of beyond the scope of what we do in terms of asking staff, projects that staff can work on. We set the budgets for them to work within and they largely um, deal with that. So have you spoken to the Good Food Dunedin team about the work that you're suggesting they do around advertising community gardens and making that information available to people wanting to set one up, those sorts of things? Well, I haven't. <laughs> no, no, and I mean, no, but we're, we're like a contact, well, self, we're slowly getting into that, but again, we're volunteers. It's got a certain amount of time that you can get out and spend on that, you know, to do that. I mean, ideally, if you've got someone and I think there is a food resilience person in the council. Is there, there is, someone? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There is, yeah. So I suppose it's just creating those networks that that can flow a bit easier, and perhaps that's something that they can negotiate and do as that's well. That's fine. And we can put yeah. we can put you in touch with them Absolutely. to have that yeah. conversation. That's fine. Yeah, that'd be great. And Thank and you. the second um, second question is around the tunnel house. Um, forgive me, I'm not much of a gardener, so I have no idea what they will, what they will cost in terms of oh. sums of money. That was, well, that was actually the Ocean Beach, um, the one out Tomahawk Reserve, they've got a fabulous one, and so that's something we'd look at as a project to do with the DCC, help fund it, and they did it as an educational workshop day, it was fabulous, and um, the, the, where we are on the hill, the wind comes straight up, if you know it, it's, it's, a, it's a really <coughs> tricky site, it's quite amazing what we do get to grow. So that would be something we'd look at applying for funding to, to do it as, right. a, as a combined. And that is, I mean, that's the kind of thing that you could apply for funding through the grants subcommittee yeah, for? not for the lease, though. We can do no, 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 for the, pro yeah. for the yeah. project yeah. itself. Yeah. Look at that, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor O'Malley. Thanks very much for coming today. Um, this is quite an exciting project, and I think um, I want to ask you this. Do you think just the level of cooperation you've got so far has managed, you've managed to achieve quite a lot? And so a lot of communities around the city are trying to do things like this, and do you really see that the council, if it just made a couple of more steps would enable this to happen in lots of other suburbs. I do, I really do. I mean, if you saw the documents and the process that went into setting it up, it's substantial. If we didn't have the support of the Valley Project, it would have been overwhelming. And the tenacity of Kelly, who was involved in the beginning, who is um, available to do, she was, she's um, not, well, she's working on this, but she's, you know, not, not in, stuck in a job like me. So, you know, it takes, a, it was a lot of work. It is pages and pages of the licensing agreement, setting it up, trying to get the shed on involved, a lot of work, you know, everything. You, uh, you know, bureaucratic processes do take a bit of time. And for a lot of, um, a lot of communities, that's overwhelming. You know, it really is. And then that money on top, when you can't charge membership fee, we can't sell anything. We've got quite clear conditions with the project as yep. to what we can do. Yep. So any food we have extra is always given away, which is great. We like that, but yes, it would. Yeah. And you actually just mentioned the Valley Project. So that's an example of a place-based community group actually enabling something to happen in the area. They're our umbrella. They look after our money. That meant, we'd, meant we didn't have to come in an incorporated society or anything like that. I mean, I worked for years at the Law Centre. I'm sort of aware of those sort of processes, setting up groups. We've had a number of people come and go. I mean, that's the reality with volunteer groups. It's the two people that were spearheading it, that were going to do it, have be, become unwell. They can't do it. So it's fallen, you know, whoever can do stuff tries to do it. Yeah. All groups have a massive yeah, problem exactly. with turnover. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. And so. um, the other last thing, just follow up on Council Hawkins' questions. I mean, would you like us to try to put together all the resources we have inside the building? Because we have mapping programs that mm. people like all transport and can great. use. Absolutely. And we do obviously have the good yeah. Yeah. network. So. I think yeah. definitely, definitely that would okay. be great. Great. Thanks, Councillor Vandevis. Thank you very much today uh, for coming today and for showing us those lovely photos. 
I was particularly delighted to hear that you've had no security problems. Yeah. And uh, to, to me, this is the uh, this is the essence, I think, of a successful community. My question is: Do you feel that it's the empathic uh, uh, role of the neighbours that has contributed to not having any security issues? The fact that. The lady next door has her kids coming and, and, and that they keep an eye on it. Do you think that that's part of the reason you don't have any security issues there? Is it location? What, what, are the, what are the things that we can do to make sure that future gardens have your very good fortune in terms of security? Because you get a security breach and suddenly it doesn't look viable anymore. It is very visible. So, you know, it, it is. It's very visible from the road, and then it's between two houses, and they're two-storey houses, <coughs> so they look right down on it. So you do feel, when you're working at it, that there can be easily people watching. Right. So, so, yeah, so being there. visible is, is yeah. part of the I reason think you think? I it is. And yep. also, honestly, when you see people, and, and, and I mean, those of you that know me, I'm quite a talker, and I'm quite personable, so you engage with people. And I think, you know, we spent... Um, a lot of time putting around leaflets. Uh, we've got a Syrian family right directly opposite, so one of my boys at school translated our wee blurb into um, Arabic, so we took it over. They come over and helped us lug a whole lot of stuff of mulch the other day. You know, there's an engagement. People know it, and they smile and come along. And So I think it's a combination. It's visible. It's beautiful. People don't want to trash it. I really thought someone would drive through <coughs> a bike or something, but, you know, nothing. And dogs, occasionally. But it's, you know what I mean? I think it, it's visible, it's beautiful, and there's a, we've really worked hard to engage mm. and to talk and to be friendly and to wave out. Mm. So anything Everyone who goes by. We, yeah. We, we, we do. <laughs> Would you like some lettuce? You know, anything we can do. Yeah. And, and, and just finally, in terms of getting things that you need for the garden, is wood chip... Uh, you know, mulch trees, that sort of thing. Is that something that you have a need for from time to time? Occasionally it is. One of the um, volunteers, Keith, uh, has chipped a lot of bits and pieces around some of our stuff. So yeah, we try and get mulch and anything we can from free places. So we put out calls on our Facebook page and farmers have got in touch and said you can come and get us some of our sheep droppings from whatever. So, yeah. Okay, are you aware that some of the um, arborists actually sometimes need yes, to get rid of six cubic metres of the stuff? Yeah, we're involved with the community garden as okay, well, which so are the all orchards. Good. So yeah, so yeah, okay. that's all good. That's great, yeah. Thank you. So that's bigger than just the community orchards, so other people could apply for that. Nice to know. Councillor Elder. Hi Lynn, it's Hello. good to see you and Maureen again. Um, and my old haunt up there, it's so good to see. So would you say um, actually the community garden adds to the safety of the community? I think so. Yeah. I mean, again, how would you tangibly prove it? But I, I, there's something, I, well, actually research overseas has shown us gardens they built in Detroit in areas where they're run down and they're not particularly gorgeous. If you create something beautiful, people start to feel safe. And I, there was a great article which I read about that. And I really feel that has that impact. I mean, it does, you watch people, they smile. Um, it is one of the prettiest gardens on the whole street. It's, it's gorgeous. Mm. And that was a really absolute... Years ago in Marae, I saw an old guy talked about how we had to have flowers, our mother for food and also for the beauty. And I really think that's important. And it's, oh, yeah. yeah. And anything that gets people walking you know, the studies show that the more people you have walking on the street, the less crime you have because you've got people looking out. So anything that we can do in the communities that increases people getting out and walking. So if people, you know, we all walk and we <laughs> go across yeah, and work yeah. there. So. Yeah. Yeah. so how do you th think the people feel in that street having that garden? What's it done to, to them? I, the comments we've had that they love it, that, that it looks beautiful, they're really pleased. It stopped me putting my house back on the market <laughs> when I got back and saw all the weeds yeah. in my garden. I looked across at the and other garden and I went, oh, and I went over and worked there. And one day we saw a young guy picking a bunch of flowers for his mum. It was just really, I mean, I know it sounds sort of little, but it is, I just know it has an impact. So do you think um, in the sense of community building, what does it do for that street and for that area? community I think, building. I think it feels cared for, it feels like it's living and it's worth something. It is an opportunity for people who don't know each other to come together and work. You know, 
you're not just meeting each other face to face, but you know you're grubbing in the in the in the dirt, and uh, and, the, and there's something about that that just makes you know introductions more easy. Mm. So, yeah. oh, thank you for that. Maureen Lynn, thank you very much for your submission. Thank, thank you. you. A nice inspiring way to start the morning. Thank <laughs> yes. you. And we can leave these. I'll um, leave these. I'll leave these. Uh, Rachel, Rachel. Like uh, Dr. McMillan. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come and talk to you today about the, um, the exciting LTP. Um, I just wanted to provide a little bit more information about a couple of things I had in my written submission, if that's okay, and then happy to take questions. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the Sustainable Development Goals um, and why I think they're really important and relevant to DCC's long-term planning. Uh, I wanted to show you that there are really specific targets within those goals across and how those targets are interlinked with each other and how they're relevant to DCC. So target 11, sustainable cities and communities. And sorry, just to go back, New Zealand signed these sustainable development goals in 2015. So uh, everybody is obliged to now put them into action and meet these goals. And New Zealand will struggle to meet many of these goals. They're for all countries, not just developing countries. And there are 17 goals across these areas. Under sustainable <coughs> cities and communities, things like safe and affordable housing, access to sustainable transport systems, especially public transport, dealing with water-related disasters, municipal and waste management, all incredibly relevant to DCC's long-term plan. Under climate action, strengthening resilience to uh, climate-related hazards and natural disasters, uh, and improving institutional capacity on climate change and mitigation and adaptation, incredibly relevant here and interlinked with the health targets, which are around reducing global traffic deaths and injuries. We know that Dunedin has some of the highest road traffic injuries in the country. Sorry. Uh, and reducing non-communicable disease mortality, things like obesity, diabetes, heart disease, all super relevant to Dunedin, and all super relevant to Dunedin City Council's role in good health and well-being. that achieving these sustainable development goals are going to require all levels of governance, not just relying on national government, but local government as well. Partnerships with large institutions like the university who have just also signed these, signed up to be um, as sustainable development goals, use them as a framework for their actions. Changing business practices and values, so working with the business, uh, uh, the Chamber of Commerce here. And, and developing these partnerships with values of health equity and sustainability. I want to remind the Mayor of our trip to Shanghai and that, that we signed up to the, um, the Shanghai Declaration for linking health and well-being and the sustainable development goals through urban planning and city planning. Um, and that the Shanghai Declaration says that health and well-being and health equity are essential in sustainable development, um, and that good government, governance, cities and communities are critical settings for health and well-being and health equity, and that, that, that Dunedin City Council has a huge role to play in putting the Shanghai Declaration into, into practice, and I want to try and hold you to your commitment in having signed that declaration. The second thing I wanted to put and add to my oral submission is a bit more about this project that we've got going on in Mangere in Auckland called Te Aramua Future Streets, which is a demonstration project for ret how we retrofit suburbs for health and well-being and sustainability by 
increasing the priority of walking and cycling and rebalancing road space towards walking and cycling. And I've put up a little link to a video um, that shows you how Te Aramua Future Streets works for health equity and sustainability. We're just coming to f um, the findings from the outcomes of that project, which are looking really, really striking in terms of lower vehicle speeds, lower road traffic injuries, and much more walking and cycling by children and by uh, adults in, for local trips. The last thing I wanted to add to my oral submission is a little bit more information about uh, how we do good resilience to climate shocks, including uh, flooding and sea level rise. And to tell you a little bit, just to highlight that Cuba is turning out to be role model in this. They have regular cyclones um, and yet uh, a much greater resilience to cyclones than say the US has. Um, through partnership working between communities, national government and local government, through a mixture of early warning and evacuation plans, but also longer term land use, housing, and construction and urban planning kinds of uh, strategic development. Um, and just as an example, both Cuba and uh, the lower parts of the US were hit by Hurricane Katrina to the same level of severity. In the US there were more than a thousand deaths, in Cuba there were none. And that's all to do with this excellent uh, partnership working between community, local and national government that we need to learn from in Dunedin, especially for South Dunedin. So that was all I wanted to add to my written submission. I'm really happy to take questions. Thanks very much to your submission. I just want to pick up on one particular point, which is recommendation number nine and um, strategy to co-design the bridge with Kaitahu. Um, Kaitahu came and presented here and said that they would want to be involved in the Steamer Basin development. So as we go forward and consider the bridge, would you want us to consider um, not only what we're going to spend on it, but whether or not we should also reconsider the design of it as well? Absolutely, yeah. So um, there's now several really good examples around the country using Te, Ar te Aranga uh, landscape design, indigenous landscape design principles, um, and Te Aramua Future Streets is one of those where partnerships with Mana Whenua have led to co-landscape design, co design, bringing back the Modi into urban urban design. To that point, have you seen the gate at Pukataraki Marae? Ah, uh, yes, I have. And that's yeah. quite a remarkable piece. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Just a, a generic question about uh, health and so on, particularly in terms of transport, and I acknowledge the efforts we are, we've tried historically in terms of public transport management, which is a fraught issue here. But in terms of cycling, um, acknowledging that we've had some um, issues with poor design and some false starts, uh, we, we seem to be in a, a bit of a hiatus in many ways because we committed and NZTA are committed to cycleways in various areas, but a lot of Dunedin people are still deeply in love with vehicles and parking them in their houses if they could get them inside. Um, do you want to make any comment about um, this general thrust towards providing better cycling facilities and or what we've done historically? So, firstly, I want to say that um, cycling is going to be central to us meeting out the sustainable development goals, um, whether they're the health goals, the climate goals, um, the health equity goals, um, the economic development goals, um, and that we're, we've got a whole lot of research now that demonstrates the, um, the health and climate benefits of investing in high quality cycling infrastructure and that that's what's important to get cycling happening in cities, especially where there's currently low levels of cycling like Dunedin. Um, but that infrastructure has to be consistent, has to be well designed, it has to be on the streets where people are going where they need to go. And that I would argue that people aren't in love with their cars. The environment is telling people that cars have the upper hand here. 
and that cars have the right here and that, cars, that we need cars to get to where we want to go. We've designed our cities to build in car dependence. Um, and that car, that car use is not a cultural thing, that we've built this in through urban design and we can build it out again by better design. And that we've had some experience now in, and I'm involved in some research about bike lash, this backlash against cycle lanes, especially around loss of parking what that's all about and how we can deal with it. Um, but I think Dunedin has managed to uh, fall between two stools in, in our recent cycling infrastructure investment history by not only uh, getting through poor design bike lash from the usual people you would see bike lash from, but also from the cyclists advocates themselves, which means that we've, we've got it wrong. Okay, so if we can't even get the support of the cycling advocates, then, then we know that things are, things are not good. But if we can put in consistent, high quality cycling infrastructure, and that doesn't mean having a cycleway halfway down State Highway 1 and then having to cross the road, then people will use it and people will start to see the benefits, including the economic benefits to local businesses of using it. And that's how we can counter bike lash. Would you provide us with those those links that you refer to yeah, in terms absolutely. of the research and the thank you. Do you have a rough idea how many tens of millions this council has already spent on cycleways in Dunedin? Yeah, I do. And how many more than tens of millions do you think we need to spend to get to the point where people will really start using the cycleways as you suggest? Yeah, so I think there needs to be partnership investment between the council and the NZTA, obviously. And this government is very committed to investing in, in cycleways and rebalancing the transport fund towards walking and cycling because they can see the benefits of that. Um, and it's, it, yeah, I mean, I think, I think um, the more you have a consistent network you have to start to have a consistent network on routes where people go to be able to see an increase in cycling. And that will require a big investment. Okay, but there were two questions there. One of them is, uh, how many tens of millions roughly do you think we've spent so far? And how many more tens of millions do you think we need to spend to get <coughs> the cycle uh, uh, infrastructure that you think is necessary? So I, I won't, I'm not going to put a number on that right now. Why not? Because I think it, would need, you know. it would need some modelling. Okay. To, it, would, it would need some modelling to no, do, if, to if do if that. And I've, so I've done that modelling for Auckland. I've done that modelling for Auckland. And they would need to spend about $3 billion across the city to get tens of percentages of cycling mode share, but for every dollar that they would spend on cycling infrastructure, they would get about $20 back in benefits, Sorry, did whether you say it's climate three or million health or benefits. Three billion? Three billion for Auckland. Three billion. Yeah, okay. and that would get done every single arterial road and every single local street to okay. be a, a cycling friendly and walking friendly street. Thank you for that. Now, you also mentioned that um, the, it's an urban design issue that we have here in Dunedin with a low uptake of, of, hill, of, of cycleways. Do you recognise that you can't urban design uh, inclement weather and a city that is particularly hilly? So there are hillier cities with more inclement weather than Dunedin with much higher cycling mode shares, which says to me that it's not inclement weather and hill, hills. We can design out hills with e-bikes, for example, um, could you give us an example of a hillier city uh, with so weather that has... Copenhagen cycle? has got much worse weather than Dunedin. Yeah, yeah, I much know. I've been to Copenhagen the and it's as flat as a pancake. And it's flat. San and, Francisco and the, has much higher mode share than Dunedin. It's yeah, a much hillier city. and most of that's flat as well. Um, c Councillor, you're involved in the okay, discussion now, you. not questions. Pardon so me. have you got any more Thank questions? You. Thank you. Thank you. No more questions? Alex, thank you very much for your submission and thank you for reminding me of how much I gained from the World Health Organisation conference in Shanghai. And 
I note that the Sustainable Development Goals are, were cited at um, COP23 in support of the climate change requirement. So it's a seamless uh, Absolutely. support structure. Yeah. So yeah. Th thank you for bringing that to our Thank you very much. Mr. Gawley. I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> we have finally managed Welcome. to shut him up. <laughs> Thank you. You are speaking for the Dunedin Multi Ethnic Council. Yes, yes, we are. Welcome again. Thank you. Tenakoto Aroha Mai Aroha Atu no Tamil Aho ko Lux Selvanesan Toku Ingawa. No Napu Yaho ko Andrew Rudolph Toku Ingawa. Dear Honourable Mayor, respected councillors, um, I am here with my brother Andrew Rudolph representing this diverse uh, committee of Dunedin Multi Ethnic Council. Uh, he is a Maori, he is a Pakiha, he is an Aucklander. Uh, he is also a Christian. Uh, I am a Hindu. Uh, I am a Sri Lankan. I am a Tamil. Uh, I am a migrant. I am also a former refugee. Although we are different, uh, what we both have one thing in common. Uh, we are dedicated Kiwis and we both are passionate about the city of Dunedin. Uh, Twenty years ago, uh, in this very building, I received a piece of paper from the then Mayor uh, Sukiterna uh, that said I was now a citizen of New Zealand. However, it was last year that I believe I became uh, a true Kiwi, uh, a real citizen of the city. Uh, why? Uh, me and my two, uh, both my boys, uh, went through a marae and spent two days there uh, and learned all about the Maori culture. Uh, and the other cultures that came to the Marae with a true exchange of cultures and, and tradition and heritage. Uh, I left the Marae feeling welcomed by the city after two year, 20 years and, and integrated into the city and felt a need to, to share my culture and tradition to the city. So I gathered all the Tamil people and within eight months after the Marae, I formed the Dunedin Tamil Society. And uh, we've shared, we've conducted a few functions and shared our culture. Um, and, and we are very happy as a, as a community. Uh, now, I'm here with the Dunedin Multi-Ethnic Council to, to represent all the ethnic communities of Dunedin. So DMEC, Dunedin Multi-Ethnic Council, supports, promotes the rights and responsibilities of ethnic individuals and groups, enabling ethnic groups to express their commitment, pride, while still protecting and sharing their ethnic heritage uh, and identity. Promoting goodwill, tolerance, understanding among people of all cultures in Dunedin. So DMEC acts as a, as a link between early settlers, the ethnic communities, former refugees, migrants, visitors to the city, temporary or, or permanent, uh, Otago University international students. Uh, this unity is celebrated under the Korowai or the cloak of Tangat Whenua, the, the land of the, the people of the land. Uh, of all things uh, that DMEC could uh, talk about or, or propose to the 10-year plan, uh, we are going to put forward one important kopapa, a purpose with two agendas for the proposal for the 10-year plan. Uh, that kopapa is porphyry, the, the welcome. Porphyry at a marae is one of them, but the citywide collective welcoming of all these communities, ethnic groups, uh, be it the, the existing citizens or new citizens of the city, to make this uh, this big small city a permanent or, or temporary home for the for for these citizens, um, this target can be achieved through two ways: community porphyry through a marae, 
and citywide race relationship week celebration. And Andrew will allude to both of them. Uh, the first part of the agenda that we've mentioned, the uh, community welcome in Pofori, we'd like to extend that to every migrant group, both external and internal, so those from overseas and those from around New Zealand, to receive a Pofori at a marae. We we're, we're well aware that we do, of course, have a, uh, an official welcome, and we think that is great. The way that we see that is that we see that as extending the hand of friendship. Uh, but we look at the pōwhiri on a marae as opening the arms to family, which is why we believe it's so important. Now, we've uh, been working with Arai Te Uru marae. Uh, the reason we've been using that marae ourselves is the fact that it's a pan-tribal marae. It's one for the people of the Four Winds, which myself, Lux, and many others of the city are. We do fall under that. Um, we believe that the, the ability to, uh, to work with tangata whenua um, is an important stepping stone in becoming a true New Zealander. When we look at treaty pr principles of uh, partnership and also participation, it is about us coming together and working as a group to eventually perhaps truly become one family. I won't call us one people, I'll call us one family instead. And that is essentially one of the goals that the DMEC has. Looking at the proposal for Race Relations Week, um, Race Relations Day falls in March, I believe it's the 21st, if I'm not mistaken, off the top of my head. Um, that is a UN celebration day that is celebrated around the world. If you've seen the Peace Pole uh, in the park next to Otago Museum, that's traditionally where we'd gathered. We'd like to open this day up to a week-long celebration that enhances and embraces all of the cultures within Dunedin. Uh, in South Dunedin, where I live, I believe there's around about 90 different ethnic cultures. Um, they create a wonderful vibrancy for this city, and it is important that we ensure that the ties that bind all of those different cultures together are strengthened as the years <coughs> pass. So hence we'd like to open this up into a week-long celebration in which ce celebrations are held at a city level. We've uh, held our first um, our first celebrations this year as part of the DMEC, where we uh, organised a number of events. They were very well received, but we are just a, a community group. There is only so much we can do, and we believe that as a city to embrace those different cultures, it's kind of time to, to bring that somewhere into the 10-year plan. Uh, we also recognise that this is not going to, be, not, not going to happen today uh, or overnight. Uh, but we ask that the DCC consider uh, the scope of uh, within their 10-year uh, plan. Um, we believe that the COPA in this proposal is in direct positioning to two of the current strategic focuses of DC DCC strategic plan, which are the social well-being strategy and the Aritoi arts and culture, culture strategy. Uh, Dunedin itself has an amazing coat of arms. Uh, it's an inclusive, uh, inclusive culture. Uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if we can interpret uh, this coat of arms with the early settlers um, hand in hand with the Tangata Whanoa uh, while standing behind all these ethnic communities uh, and different groups in Dunedin uh, with Dunedin Multi-Ethnic Council, with this uh, Manakitanga, of respect for each other and harmony of existence. Uh, and with that, we, we thank the council and the mayor for, for listening to us and giving us the opportunity for the ethnic communities to, to have a voice. Thank you. You have to take questions? Yeah, sure. Please. Um, thanks for your input. I was just wondering, your, your experience of going to the marae, yes. um, how did that change your sense of belonging, do you think? Um, it made us feel more connected to the, uh, to the Maori culture and also gave us an opportunity to learn the culture properly. And one of the things we noticed is that when you approach the marae, you leave your footwear outside and that's, we do that in Tamil culture also. Uh, we go, every house you have to leave your footprint outside. So we had an opportunity to connect in that level. And both my boys, they born and brought up here. So they were also, you know, got an opportunity to learn. 
Mm. So when it comes to new migrants, what do you think the kind of process should be if they are welcome to our city and we shake their hands and what have you? Um, what kind of process would you see as being helpful? For the new migrants? Mm. Um, I believe the new migrants come from different walks of life. They are maybe temporary, three years degree in a university, or they just come for a visit. Um, but those receiving citizenship, they come to the, you know, to the, uh, and then receive the certificate. But if they have an opportunity to uh, go to MRI and spend one, one day or two days, uh, including other cultures present and also learn the Maori culture, I think that will give them a sense of belonging and integrate them better into the city. Uh, I strongly believe that after 20 years being in Dunedin. Mm. Mm. That's a great story. Thank you. Thanks, for <clears throat> Thanks Lux and Andrew for coming here today. So when Sri Lanka plays down at the Oval, are you conflicted? Oh <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Um, when you're looking at your race relations week, have you thought of maybe turning that into a race, race festival, um, a festival of all cultures and ethnicities? Um, because we have the Dunedin Destination Plan and we have our own festival programs. And a way to potentially advertise Dunedin as a multi-ethnic city would be to actually elevate it to the level of a festival. So would you want to do something like that and yeah. have the council involved at that level? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, yeah. that's, the, that's exactly the proposal that, that we are uh, hoping. At uh, the moment, the two festivals, I, as far as I know, is the Chinese, uh, in the Chinese New Year. And I also know that Diwali is also another festival that the, the city is involved. But this 10-day celebration over two weekends and, and just both sides of the race relations day will give an opportunity for, for all cultures to be welcomed and, and maybe you know, give their input or their, um, share their culture. As well as to showcase the city as a place yes. with all its cultures. Yes, absolutely. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just following on from the question, some of my questions have been answered, but um, I just wondered if, if you felt the multi-ethnic council would have a role in organising such a festival with support from council. Is that what you're thinking? We, Showing leadership in that? We would be more than happy to uh, provide that link. Uh, you know, we think of as people from the ground, on the ground forces. <laughs> And uh, ground forces are more than happy to help, you know, make that link and, and connection and gather the people. Excellent. Thank you for bringing the idea to us. <coughs> Councillor Hawkins. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, just in the, in the interests of building on what exists, which is essentially the theme of, of what you're trying to do here, um, there are a number of fairly significant events that are run by the various... Um, for want of a better term, ethnic student groups on campus, whether that's you know, cultural performance evenings or the International Food Festival or whatever. Um, would that be a helpful place to start to try and corral everything that is currently happening into some semblance of proximity? <laughs> like bringing together things, rather than trying to start something from the ground up, which as we all know is quite difficult. I'm trying to coordinate the groups um, that are already doing that kind of work and, and just wondering whether you've spoken to any of them in this process? Yes, absolutely. We, yeah, we, have, um, we actually do have a, uh, a member of the council who is an international student who has been working with the various groups within the university themselves. Of course, our uh, president, uh, Macdonald Paul Gawley, is, uh, has very good connections. He's very nearby. Him. Indeed. Mm. <laughs> so I mean, we've we've also uh, looked with the international, uh, the OUSA international uh, officer, uh, Umi, who has been um, uh, privy and part of quite a few of our uh, events that we've put on, and we're hoping to, uh, as we showed in one of our slides, um, provide an umbrella to help them come together. Essentially, yeah, definitely. Great. Thank you. Um, just picking up on your suggestion of uh, welcoming Pofre uh, to the city, uh, do, you, do you appreciate, do you mentioned that, it, that you, you're suggesting it ought to be on a marae, and do you appreciate that the marae don't belong to the council, and further, that if it were to be a welcome to this place, then we would 
be looking to the mana whenua rather than the broader tangata whenua with regard to that. So in a sense, it's not a welcome, it's not something that council is in control of, if you see what I'm... Absolutely. I mean, we do understand that there is the, the official welcome as such. Um, when we talk about uh, marae, I guess we're talking about uh, well, those poverty. we're talking about, I guess, a broader community level uh, welcome. So that could be more along the lines of uh, introducing people to a marae. And this is why we mention Araiteoru with being a pan-tribal marae. So it's for those who are outside their normal areas um, who can come to a place and have that place become their own. <coughs> so I guess I'm, what I'm asking in, in, the, in that regard is if it's, w w what would council necessarily have to do with that? Um, simply, I, I would say things there could be, for example, uh, help in terms of logistics, of just advertising, getting the word out amongst communities and things like that. Uh, we as a community group have very limited reach in terms of those wider advertising um, goals and things like that. So we're, we're not necessarily saying that we would like the council to take over this. Uh, we're simply asking for some assistance, right, essentially. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. No more questions. Thank you very much for your submission. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Mr Wright. Welcome, Chris. How you doing? And you're here representing Football South. That's correct, yeah. Well, the next five minutes are yours. Thank you. Your Worship, um, Honourable Councillors, uh, thank you for the opportunity to um, submit vocally um, to the long-term plan today. Um, I just want to um, mention as well that we really appreciate the efforts that the Council have gone to to consult widely with the long-term plan um, and to involve um, members of the organisations around the city. Uh, today, um, I just wanted to present on our key project um, over certainly the next six months. Um, which is the artificial turf project at Logan Park. Um, it's a part of our submission, um, but I think it would be great just to give you an update today uh, and to take any questions about the future progress of the facility. Uh, so um, again, thank you um, for your continued support, both financially um, and through the support of your staff members in the Parks and Recreations team. Uh, in particular, I just want to make, make a mention of thank you to, um, to Jen D. Gareth Jones, Robert West, uh, Leanne Mash, uh, and Sandy Graham, who um, have really helped drive this project forward over the last six months. Uh, as you're aware, the, the costs of the facility have risen um, due to geotechnical issues at Logan Park. And we've continued to for fundraise towards a target of 3.8 million in order to complete the facility uh, to the specification we intended. Uh, to date, we've secured an additional $50,000 and we're now waiting on a number of funding applications in order to, to reach our goal. Uh, in particular, this includes a significant application um, of around $800,000 to the um, National Lottery Significant Projects Fund. Um, one of the benefits of the project uh, reaching $3 million of funding is that it opened a new funding mechanism for us through this project, which has a $3 million minimum threshold. Um, the, the result of that application will have a large bearing on the, the future of the facility. Um, if we can get close to the funding goal, then it's likely we can build it as intended. Um, if we're far away, then um, we're coming close to exhausting in our opinion, the funding mechanisms available for the region. Um, I'd like to mention that I think we've done exceptionally well compared to, to other past projects to raise the level we have, um, which shows the buy-in of the local funding organisations to the project. Uh, we received the result of that funding application in early June, uh, and that will inform our next steps with more certainty. Um, either way, we plan to build something starting in September, October this year, um, due to the, the FIFA funding expiring. 
uh, whether that facility is is one pitch with smaller training areas or two full pitches is, is yet to be seen depending on the funding. Um, we obviously want to impact as much as possible on the key goal of the project which is to be able to play uh, evening games and trainings in the city and, and halving the number of playable fields especially for senior teams is going to be uh, to detriment of the facility and may not be supported by the existing funders. Uh, in, in terms of um, other elements to mention, you know, there's, we've talked in the past about other facilities in the long-term plan. I think the success of this facility, and in particular its usage and its popularity, will inform us as to what are the requirements of the city um, in conjunction with uh, the Parks and Recs team's um, evaluation of the needs of the sports. So we're obviously looking forward to getting it in place so we can understand what the requirements are for further sport usage of artificial surfaces in the city. Uh, and the last thing I just wanted to mention is a, is a thank you um, or a special recognition to Andrew Kennelly um, of the Sports and Recs Department who, since he has come in and managed the contractors um, in, in particular City Care and Delta, and we've seen a marked improvement in the quality and maintenance um, of the fields. Thank you, Chris. Questions, Thanks for your presentation and thanks for your recognition of the staff and helping you out. Um, my question is, um, the university and the Polytech gain a great deal from that Logan Park area and, and possibly the Highlanders and that franchise. I was just wondering what kind of um, input they could have put into this project and um, yeah, any, any, any queries on that? Yeah, it's a good question. So the Highlanders have committed some financially to this project since I last presented. Um, right. And, it, and it, it maybe we go back to them in the future, but obviously you're right, they, they're really keen for this project to happen. Um, they're also committing as a key user um, of the facility to pay commercial rights to use you know, several hours per week, um, which will help with the, the ongoing running of the facility and replacement of the turf following its 12 year to 15 year life cycle. Uh, in terms of the university and the polytechnic, um, they both um, already provide significant support through to many sports, including football, in particular with the scholarship programs. Um, okay. So annually, we, in conjunction with the two organisations, have currently 17 scholarship students in the city, all of who um, are under free fees agreements, which is obviously a big investment. So um, while, the, while they are supportive and interested in the facility, that there hasn't been success with funding raising through them to date. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thanks for the presentation, Chris. I just it's a perception question I actually just want to ask you about. Um, I, out at the community board at Wakawaiti, there was a group that came in for a bowls club and they were referring to how the rugby fields are mowing every day by the city and they don't pay anything. And I pointed out that clubs pay quite a substantial amount of money um, to be able to pay. And I asked the president of the University Football Club, who you know I know fairly well, which is my daughter. Um, they have six men's teams and four women's teams, and I think they pay 2,000 for each men's team and 1,500 for each women's team. So we calculated that was 18,000 a year they're paying fees. Yep. What proportion of that goes back to field fees? So uh, as part of my written submission, um, I put some information in there about a project that I'm working on at the moment with New Zealand Football. Called the, it's called the Future of Football Project. It's something that I've driven based on my experiences in the sports and rec sector to date. Uh, and that explores um, a number of things, but in particular the, the research so far has highlighted um, a big difference between different cities in terms of how sporting organisations thrive and survive. Uh, so. Uh, I'll answer this long-winded, sorry, but the, there are sort of three things that dictate the, um, the cost of a club um, to, to enter or the, um, the capability of a club. So there's a charge to enter competitions which um, have overheads such as um, grounds, facilities, um, referees, um, the, the computer systems that run it, the staff to run the competitions. Um, the, the cost that a member is willing to pay and the available funding in the region. Uh, in our case, about 40% of our charges to clubs um, is just as passing on the, the DCC um, ground charges. Um, if you think of it in the way of Christchurch's example, they pay no or very little ground charges. They've got much higher accessibility to funding in the region, particularly through the gaming trusts. 
um, and obviously access to better sponsorship opportunities. Uh, and the, the members there are generally willing to pay higher due to high salaries. So um, in Dunedin, we, we have a low expectation of how much a member can pay, and we have a high, ground, uh, high cost to enter the competitions, um, partially due to grant charges, uh, and there's less access to grant funding and sponsorship. Um, so what that means is that a Christchurch club um, may make, for example, off a ninth grade team, over $1,000 just entering a team, whereas the, the same team in Dunedin, it'll come out at about 100 to $200. And for that, they've got to invest in kits and coaching, getting the players to and from the venues. Uh, and unlike other sports, football isn't funded from a national body um, through, for example, rugby get, get a um, a fair amount of recognition through TV rights or, or cricket. Um, unfortunately, football, we kind of have to pay the other way. For, for example, we pay Sky to be involved in the National League. Um, so it's a very different environment, and it's probably similar for, for other winter sports, such as hockey. Um, yeah, so we, we would love to make the, the charge to clubs lower um, so that the clubs would have more room to develop their own capability and develop their own quality of experience as well as invest into facility projects. But at the moment, the environment is that they're kind of just getting by. Or looking at it from another perspective, if the clubs are already, so that would make the university clubs paying around about 7,500 a year in field ground fees, that if those clubs are actually paying a substantial amount of the running, well, not a substantial amount, but a significant contribution towards, then it's not inappropriate and then the city be looked at for assistance when it comes to facilities development because that money if yep. it had been distributed differently, it would be coming out in a different form. Yeah, agreed. Yep. Okay, thanks. Uh, I just, I'm, I'm intrigued by Christchurch not charging, so I've gone to the website, and yep. it says it's $112.20 to book a large sports field. Are you saying there's something else that happens for organised sport that's different to that? Yeah, so as, as far as I understand, talking to the CEO of, of Mainland Football, they pay for um, game day charges, especially for artificial fields. Mm -hmm. um, but the training, um, the training fields and maintenance of the fields is no cost during the season. Uh, so for for us, we pay a fixed fee for a, um, a whole season. Yeah, a whole season for a, we've got a bulk contract essentially for about sixty, seventy thousand dollars for a whole season that covers trainings, games, and all the maintenance. Whereas the the cost is much lower for Canterbury clubs to be involved. Okay, thank yeah. you. I think it's to the level where um, mainland football don't actually pass the charges on um, to the clubs, um, and they may even get it funded if there is a small charge for games. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Um, I just want to seek clarification in my, for my own mind. So you're talking about additional, in your submission, you're talking about additional um, turfs in addition to extra to what you're building already. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I, the, um, as I said, the, it, it's quite hard to tell how many turfs would be adequate for a city like ours. Uh -huh. um, we do have a high percentage of participation in, um, in organised <coughs> sport. Um, obviously, we haven't got one multi-sport turf yet, so the priority is to get that in place and, and see how it's received and how much it's used. But I'd like the council to consider um, investment or at least tagging investment for potential future facilities in the long-term plan. Uh, per population, we have a, a lower ratio than most cities in New Zealand in terms of, of artificial sport facilities. Yeah. Um, so it would seem like it would be a, a needed and good investment. Um, but to, to further... I guess understand exactly to what level we'd need to do a feasibility study um, and we need to do some more analysis on the, the sports and recs um, needs of the, of the various sports in the city. So, but am I correct in inferring that you are talking six million dollars over ten years, say? That's what you were asking for? Well, my, I gave an example um, in, the, in my submission that um, by... It, it, I don't want to come to council and say just find an extra six million dollars. Um, so I gave, I just as an example, gave that you could choose sort of option B in some of the the larger scale projects that would free up funding, um, and a portion of that would enable you to achieve, and say, three artificial turfs or six artificial turfs. Um, so it's it's not a proposal that that's the exact amount, but um, certainly. Um, Football South submission is give, given a choice of if it's got to be between 
um, an architecture bridge or more investment or a medium investment in the in the center city if if some of that could be rechanneled into facilities such as this in our opinion it would be a wiser investment thank you chris thank you very much for your submission thank you I worship the Mayor, Honourable Councillors. Uh, my name is Gareth McMillan, and I'm here today to speak on behalf of the Dunedin Fringe Arts Trust, but more broadly, the city's creative sector. Four of Dunedin's professional permanent arts organisations submitted a joint written response to the draft 10 year plan, and this expresses our gratitude to the Council for being one of the few New Zealand cities with an arts and culture strategy. We agree with the key focus of the 10-year plan, to attract people to live, work and study in Dunedin. This complements the work of the Fortune Theatre, the Dunedin Symphony Orchestra, Arts Festival Dunedin and the Dunedin Fringe Arts Trust. We live in exciting times, with another recent announcement of a headline act set to fill our stadium representing one of the more visible ways that the creative sector contributes to the financial and social well-being of the city. For those of us that work in the arts, these are also challenging times. We have now had several decades of neoliberal influence policy, which has resulted in changes to our education system, and the current generation of students and young people entering the workforce prioritise applied subjects at the expense of arts and critical thinking. Now, I'm not here to debate esteem versus STEM pedagogy or hold you personally responsible for the downgrading of the arts within our society, but I am here to advocate for our sector and the publicly available information contained within the draft 10-year plan is of concern to us. To use the example of the stadium, international acts are not choosing to perform in the city because we have a spectacular natural and built environment. They're coming here because Dunedin upgraded the capacity of the city to host these events, and I include DVML team in this, as they have clearly proven themselves successful. Now I ask the question, how many people in New Zealand know that Dunedin is home to the second largest Friends Festival in the country? How many people in Dunedin know this? We're doing all we can with the resources we have, and a 52% increase in event finder ticket sales for this year's Fringe Festival is evidence of this but I encourage you to consider supporting your existing proven events alongside the new projects envisaged in the consultation document. I refer you to the Community and Planning Group Information Income Statement, page 48. During the period 2019 to 2028, expenditure on grants and subsidies, which is what we in the sector uh, assume means us, is increased from 3,765,000 to 4,177,000. But if we look at the rate of inflation remaining at 2.5%, the figure in 2028 should be 4,701,000. So in other words, the proposed plan will increase rates and in expenditure on large capital projects while simultaneously reducing the support for the creative sector. This comes at a time when the cost of producing festivals and events is ever increasing. Regulations such as the Health and Safety at Worked Out 2015 place a large burden of responsibility on producers, especially like uh, those like the Fringe Festival, who create work in public and non-traditional spaces such as the hot salt water pool. Just as an aside, the producers of Elemental, which was an amazing event at the hot salt water pool, and featured as the hero image for the Fringe and Kiora magazine, were critical of the council red tape approach they encountered during the production and they're less than committed to ever mounting a production like this again, and that's just an absolute loss for the city. We aspire to pay the minimum of a living wage to all our staff and contractors, and the truth is we have an unwritten expectation of them that they'll work voluntary hours as well, and this lowers their remuneration to less than the minimum wage in most cases. And I find it unacceptable that in a city that aspires to place arts and cultures at its core, that proudly celebrates the Dunedin Sound and our city of literature status, would also expect its professional industry to be effectively managed by people working for good wool and below legal rates. Now, I know you would have heard many submissions from those who advocate a core services only role for council, and you will also have heard from many vested interests protecting their patch. 
but when it comes to discussions about funding of the arts, we'll always lose a binary argument if it's framed in terms <coughs> such as poetry versus children growing up in deprivation. So I just hope that you're able to see the greater complexities at play and that by properly supporting your creative sector, you'll be more likely to achieve the intended outcomes of the 10-year plan. We are a sector that thrives on collaboration, and I envisage performances taking place on the new pedestrian bridge, for example. Arts projects that respond to the city's water strategy, such as Envoy, that work with the city's property stock, for example, the Urban Dream Brokerage, which utilises the city's vacant commercial spaces. By endorsing Aratoi Otipoti, the Dunedin City Council has shown other councils how to engage with their creative sectors. It is a document with tangible meaning and it guides our collaboration with council and our work in practice. I encourage you to apply the same foresight and wisdom to your 10-year plan deliberations. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here today. Thank you. Are you happy to... Hey, questions? Absolutely. Sure. Questions, councillors? Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you for your submission and your frankness. Um, I just wanted a little bit of clarification or just to ask a direct question uh, looking forward. So you've mentioned some of the things that we are doing well, um, and Aratoi was obviously one of those. Looking forward, if you could identify one single thing that you'd like to see put into that 10-year plan, what would it be? <coughs> one single item. Uh, increased uh, financing for uh, festivals and events in the, in the creative sector. Further questions, councillors? There are none. Thank you for your um, submission. Um, I just note that the lack of questions just indicates that we've already had some submissions exactly on the subject from some other groups. So um, we're but thank you for reinforcing the message. Lovely. Councillor Vandivis. Sorry, if I could be allowed just one short related question. Certainly. Um, uh, could you just enlarge a little bit on the red tape issue that you had um, with the saltwater? Oh. Well, just to clarify, it was an issue between an independent producer of an event and the venue and the council's property department. Um, obviously, uh, as the event falls under the umbrella of the fringe, we were in involved and did sort of help broker a little bit of a resolution. Um, is it appropriate to go into details, or is that sufficient answer? Just if you have any suggestion, have uh, any suggestion about what, what we what we might do better. Yeah, absolutely. Briefly, um, look. Can, can I just interrupt there? I, this is um, an operational issue, and. I think there's a risk that we won't canvass it thoroughly. I'm, I'm more than happy to have it canvassed, but I'm concerned. Ms. Mash, you have. Sure. Sure, and we do we do have um, there are some things at play that are helping to resolve that. I'll just say. Great. As, as long as it's been looked at, I'm a more than happy. Absolutely. I just don't think it would be satisfactorily done in public necessarily. For sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Brown. Welcome, Mark. Good morning. Thank you for giving me five minutes to um, give you some ideas of what I consider uh, important when you're um, looking at your your ten-year plan. Um, Dunedin's already attracting visitors in precedented numbers. The word's out that we're already a great place to visit. But we need to have the infrastructure to, to handle um, these, these numbers, and I don't believe it's there. I can't see the point in, in attracting more people if we don't have that infrastructure to... to um, to make it a, a, a good stay for them. We've, we've got some wonderful assets that are already here. We don't need to build new big things to attract people. We know they're already coming and we know why they're coming for. A couple of examples of this that I, I think are very, that, that could be um, a great advantage to the city is, one of them is the um, walking tracks. There are very few cities that 
I know of that have such an array of walking tracks so close to the city centre. Many of these have been neglected or in poor repair. It would not take a lot to link many of them together. So I, I, my, I think we could, we could have walking tracks that did the length of the Otago Peninsula, cross the harbour by boat at, at, um, to Aramoana. You could carry on along Haywards Point, meeting up with Mickey Walker, Mount Cargill, and on to Swampy. Or even linking up the harbour cycle tracks could be a, a huge advantage to um, a lot of tourists. These routes take in scenery that's amazing, and it would create investment and employment along the way. We've seen examples like the rail trails that have been built around the country where, where this has happened, where small, small places um, are benefiting um, hugely by, by the numbers that are, are coming by. <clears throat> It would help to keep visitors in our city longer. It's well known that um, in, the, in the retail sector that we're 100% better off by getting 10% more spend from our customers than increasing the number of customers <coughs> by 10%. And I think that's what we need to work on is, is, is the people that are already visiting because there's huge potential to get more from them. Another asset that the, the council have is the, the, the Dunedin Botanic Gardens. This is, you know, it's recognised as, as world class. And, and as you tell us in the, in the little book here that we, we, we can't sit on our laurels and must make improvements all the time. This is an amazing asset, the Botanic Gardens, and we must treasure it and give it the investment it deserves instead of squeezing it to the point where cuts have to be made. It's the only Dunedin institution I know of that still has an apprentice system. It is one huge horticultural classroom that is grossly underutilised. It could attract students from all over the country or world for a learning experience in a world-class garden, which could also include the Chinese gardens, um, the, the Ovalston gardens, the railway station gardens. You know, these are all council-owned um, assets that are, that are already there, but we just need to um, to, to use them and, and make, them, make the most from them. I read where it's costing more to do the do usual work. I would suggest that the work and products themselves aren't actually costing a lot more than they were 10 years ago. But what's adding the huge, the, the, the extra costs is the, is the um, bureaucracy and red tape that goes with having to be a council contractor. And it's <coughs> huge. Um, th this process, it's leaving out small business. Um, small businesses are, are no longer able to afford to become um, council suppliers or contractors because of because of the, the process that's involved. And we must remember that small business employs 80% of the people in this country. So please remember to, to include them in, in your decisions because it's a, you know, it's, I presume it's 80% of the people employed around Dunedin are, are also employed by small business. So we need to support them. I have made comments about this before, and I'm told that we need to, you know, that the, the ratepayer needs to um, get its get best value from all these financial decisions. But I suggest the best value you can give a ratepayer is to employ them. Another um, um, difference these days, um, from my experience, is we don't have the depth of knowledge in the managers that are managing certain departments. They don't have the knowledge of what they're managing. So there's, there's, um, there's consultants required to, to, to give um, information to, um, to um, make management decisions, which is a, is, a, is a huge cost. It is refreshing to see councillors employ their own engineer, 
engineer to deal with coastal erosion, and I, I think that's great because we've got one person doing all the work. We're not moving from um, consultant and consultant and, and um, replicating work already done, which I see a number of um, happening a number of times. I think the part the, one of the problems with the new processes is that we're trying to save money, but we're save we're spending more than what we're saving and trying to save that uh, uh, amount. I think it's arrogant to make a 7% increase in rates straight away. None of the rate powers are in a position to immediately increase their own income by, by the same amount. I understand about investment and the need for it, um, especially where it generates a return. But firstly, in, in my own situation, when I'm looking at a, an expansion or something, I look at what I'm doing and check that everything is running efficiently and make changes required before we move on. I suggest there's a lot not running efficiently in the Dunedin City Council at present, and this needs to be sorted out before taking on glamour projects and unnecessary spending. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Are you happy to take questions? I am. Councillor Vanders. Um, you've, you've said, Mark, that 10% that, uh, uh, more spend from our existing visitors is far more value than a 10% increase in visitors. Absolutely. And, and, and to me, that's a, a really quite interesting concept, and, and I can actually see the logic on it now that you put it that way. How, however, do you suggest we go about getting that 10% extra spend? Is it that we offer extra uh, things for people to do, or do we start charging for the museums and, and other such things? How would you suggest we go about getting that 10% more spend from our visitors? Um, well, my walking track idea is, is I, I think, is an example of people would stay longer if they can, instead of just doing day walks, there could be a four day walk. I think the charging of museums is essential. There's, I think Australia is the only other country I've ever been to where you can go to a museum free. But, but we need to. They're wonderful assets. And, and um, you know, you see people, I, forget, I'm, I can't quote the numbers that go to Toy Tu, but you know, we only need $10 from every person and all of a sudden it, it puts a different light on that, on that asset. They, people aren't trying to, to get funding um, as much all the time, but, but we do need to charge. It's, it's like the camping thing, the Freedom Campers, as most of you know, you, you, I'm a supporter of Freedom Camping, but they don't need to be free. You know, there's places in Europe, uh, car parks, where you can... You can Park the night and you pay a night charge. If you're still there at eight or nine in the morning, you pay the day charge. No one expects anything for free, but there is a market there for that lower. We know the camping grounds can't hold these people. Um, there's just too many of them, but we do need to allocate places for them, and then you don't, we don't need security companies to race around and chasing them up. Or we know where they all are. Thank you very much. Councillor Alder. Thanks for your submission. I was just interested, what kind of infrastructure do you think we need to get people um, walking our hills and um, biking them? What kind of infrastructure? Well, we, need, we need the tracks. We need good tracks. We need well-maintained tracks. We need some toilets. Recently I went to Stewart Island, an amazing array of tracks. I know it's a bit of a different situation, but I believe DOC are paid accordingly to visitors that visit the island. And, the, you know, there's a, there's a DOC-style toilet at the beginning of most tracks or somewhere along it, and um, they don't have nearly as many visitors as Dunedin gets, and yet it, they've got this wonderful infrastructure of, uh, which attracts people. So in your opinion, um, putting that infrastructure in will attract more people. What do you think about also the health and well-being of our own people and, and getting them walking and on, on our hills? How to get them walking? Well, it's, it's the same, same issue of mine. Is, you know, if there's, there's lots of people, but the locals are doing day, day trips now. They don't need to go for five days, but... Uh, 
a lot of them may do. Look at the Banks Peninsula tracks. They were a huge success. And that was private. Um, mm. If private people can do it, why can't, why can't a city council? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you. Mr. Cash. Greetings, former comrade. <laughs> It does feel funny. I figured I had to show up though because I spent six years convincing I, I everyone else to do so. I think this was urgent, not related to the submitter. <laughs> All right, but welcome, Jinty. Your the five next five minutes are yours. Thank you. And um, I'd just like to start by acknowledging how difficult this job is for all of you guys. I just sitting here for the last half hour. I remember both the lateness <laughs> and also how tricky it is to balance everyone's priorities. So um, here's just another couple of thoughts to um, to add to the general pool. Um, I guess I didn't want to go through all the specific points in my submission again. I've, I've spoken to a, a range of different things there and it would take more than five minutes. Um, but I thought I'd just touch on a couple of the key themes um, in my submission. Um, the first is, is the theme of um, completing commitments. Um, I was on council for six years when we developed a range of strategies and plans. Um, and I've realised coming off council how hard it is for the average punter to actually know how they're being progressed. Um, I, I acknowledge the, the non-financial reporting that's coming through, um, but it's hard to tell at, at any given time how many streams are being um, progressed under those existing strategies and plans. So um, I guess uh, without full knowledge of, of maybe they're all fully funded and they're all um, perfectly adequately moving forward. But my plea would be, um, I think those existing commitments are really important to honour um, and um, please councillors make sure that they are adequately funded um, going forward. Um, the second th key theme is around preserving flexibility for, for future councils and, and for the community. Um, and I guess there are three aspects to this. Um, I've noted that um, I think in the out years there's an intention to sell down about two thirds of the property investment portfolio. Um, my, 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 I had a few alarm bells at that. Um, I think that um, you, you need to look carefully at that. I think one of the real benefits that this council has had in, in the past has been these um, non-rates revenue streams that have enabled rates to stay um, low and um, enabled the council to invest in a range of things without um, increasing or without causing unaffordable um, outcomes for our community and um, so preserving those non-rates forms of revenue I think are really important. Uh, the second key theme around that is um, ensuring that you've got the best possible information about future conditions to, um, to, to draw into your decisions about investments. Um, and I think in my, in my um, submission I highlight a couple of work streams that it's unclear from the materials whether they're funded or to the degree to which they're funded, and that's the climate change adaptation work um, and the uh, compact of mayors work. I know that this council's been very supportive of both of those streams of work, so I guess I'd just ask that you check in to make sure that they are adequately funded going forward. Um, and the final... Um, point I'd like to make there is, um, is that you know there wasn't one annual plan or long-term plan um, that I was on council that you didn't get a whole raft of new funding needs coming in and that is inevitable over the next 10 years. Um, I can think of several uh, that are on the horizon, one being around the waste management and minimisation plan. I know that that work is um, underway and that's great to see Councillor Mallory and I think there are uh, Oh yeah, Councillor Newell are on that. I was on that last time, it's good fun. Um, but gee, there's some big questions here around you know, landfill. Um, I, I think one of the key things I um, discovered looking at Auckland's approach to their waste management and minimisation plan is that they've been wise enough to really front foot a whole bunch of investment, I think led by Councillor Hulse up there, um, uh, into community-based waste minimisation infrastructure. Um, and that takes capital, so you're going you're gonna to have capital requirements. Um, so I, I guess I'd be, I'm just highlighting these things. I think social housing is another key question for this community. Um, there, are, there are a range of those, those sort of costs coming up and I'd urge you not to fully expend your 
10-year kitty um, this financial year in the knowledge that, that will, um, there will inevitably be additional re requests for funding. Um, so I guess those are the key quest things I wanted to raise and in the interest of time, noting how late you are, um, I'll, um, I'll stop there. Well, that's very considerate of you, thank you. Um, questions, councillors? Councillor Vanders. Thank you very much. Good to see you again, Ginty. Um, I, I, I note that, that you've uh, got a phrase in your um, uh, submission here that says that you couldn't find any analysis of specific implications of the proposed for the revenue from the property investment portfolio uh, in papers provided to council. Now, I also know that you're very thorough at finding things, and if you can't find an analysis, that perhaps it's not there. Um, you say that uh, revenue uh, generated from property investment sales would offset rates, but you warn that the more property that is sold in the short term, the higher rates will be in the future. Do you think that this has been adequately highlighted in our 10-year plan? Well, I guess it's a question for councillors, really, and, and I acknowledge that, I mean, I, I went through the background papers, but I'm not deeply embedded in it. I did it in about four hours in an afternoon. So um, the, there may well be information there that I wasn't able to find, or it may have been in non-public papers, I'm not sure. Um, but I guess it, it did, it just raised some red flags for me not, not seeing that analysis. It, it could be that the, the property um, portfolio isn't generating the return um, that it's um, meant to be generating. Um, in my view, that's not necessarily a, re a reason to, um, to give that up as a, a revenue stream. It might be a reason to, s to sell down that portfolio and invest in other direct revenue streams or um, other, other approaches that will, that will have a direct revenue stream for council. But I think that direct revenue stream, Lee, is, is super important. Um, you know, having, having the companies there, having, having other investment op options that aren't rates-based, I think has, has given this, has served this community so well for so, so many decades, and it would be a real shame to lose that flexibility. So just to summarise then, selling property assets, you would just ask us to be really careful about how we went about that. Absolutely, and, um, and to consider alternatives, if you are looking at selling it down because it's not performing, consider investing that money in, in other initiatives that will generate a direct financial return to council, because, um, yeah, to reserve that revenue stream. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you for your submission, and I'm just going to follow up Councillor Vandervis's comment there. Some of us in here are yeah, um, the resolutions of previous councils, and, and one of the resolutions was that when an asset is sold, it must go be applied against debt. So the discussions that I believe that we've been having with Treasury is how do you deal with that when, it, when it's a property sale, is that if you want to do it, make another investment in property, that it will have to go through the transition of being <laughs> applied against the debt, and then we'd go and get more debt to go back out into that transition. Effectively, it would be a horizontal move, but it has to go in that direction in order to meet the current resolutions that mm. uh, over um, so so in that mind I think are you saying that you just want to make sure we're not just going to sell stuff off so we can go off and have a spend over here well I think that that's the risk so yep. I think council's resolution having been part of the council that, that made that move um, it was at a time of very high debt so um, that was a priority of the day to to pay down that debt I think the risk of having that as a standing resolution ad infinitum um, is that you, would in effect, just just end up with sp spending <laughs> um, because you, you don't necessarily, at the moment, debt levels, I think, are pretty acceptable um, for the community and, and you wouldn't necessarily want to be um, creating a situation in which um, you, you're effectively just selling stuff to spend. Um, now, I'm not su suggesting that's necessarily what the council's doing, but I, I think you need to look carefully in those out years um, at, at what is proposed um, with that property investment portfolio and just right. make sure that you're very comfortable with it. I think those resolutions can be changed by, by resolution of council. So if council's view is that, um, and I think it was certainly something which I flagged up with the parks portfolio in the, the last years, there were a couple of sales there that happened, which in my view should have been redirected into parks infrastructure um, rather than, than debt repayment. Um, and so I, I would encourage council to look at that policy again. Okay, so that's, that's a good piece of feedback actually in that regard. Um, the waste management and um, resource recovery, yes, you are 
we are starting on that now. And um, we had a very interesting discussion while standing on top of the Green Island landfill. Um, and you are quite right, at the moment, what we're going to spend on that future is not fully budgeted for. Um, the, the closure of and, and shutting down of the, of the landfill is there, but the building of um, transfer stations and community transfer stations, all that is not particularly well budgeted for. So are you flagging to us that as we are approaching our debt ceiling, that we have some unknown expenditures into the future? And also with climate change and other such things, we may be coming across a whole we don't even know are coming yet, but we should anticipate they're out there. Absolutely. That, yep. that we need to be very careful as we go through this particular spend that we're keeping eye, our eyes on that debt horizon. Yeah, I mean, all of the, all of the various horizons. So I know Council's financial strategy has got a, a range of different um, elements to it, and, and debt is obviously one of them. Asset sales I'm flagging up is another one yeah, um, that you, yeah. <laughs> you might want to be careful around. Related, yeah. yeah, but I, I think that what struck me about the, the landfill um, issue is that there's effectively a double hit there because on, um, it may not still be the case, but certainly when I was on council, you were getting a, a dividend or a re revenue stream um, from, from the landfill. And then there was also um, the, the impact of having to build more facilities and um, looking at another couple of councils around the place. I know basically because they haven't had any money, they've used the private sector to finance infrastructure investment in waste. And I think that that has led to really poor outcomes in terms of waste minimisation and poor outcomes in terms of the other tenants of the Waste Mins Act mm -hmm. um, around you know, social and, and, and environmental and economic wellbeing. So I, I think you, you'll have a double hit there that you need to, to manage from 2023 onwards. Um, and so I, I'm, I encourage you to keep a bunch of money in the kitty. In fact, to start looking at expenditure in the next couple of years around now. I'm really excited about the waste management, management minimisation plan and where you guys will take that. Yeah. Cool, thank you. And then your last comment, uh, just last comment around public transport and dialogue with the ORC. We've been in dialogue here and there over the years and my general investigation into this appears to be that there are some aspects of the Land Transport Management Act that, that, that preclude us from ever being able to ever have the buses under our control. And I'm suggesting to the council we might start changing our tack and actually head towards that act and ask central government to change some of the wording there so that mm. we can have a more meaningful discussion as to how the buses are run. What, yeah. what would your opinion on that approach be? Personally, I think that's very wise. I mean, this government, it seems to me, is taking um, an approach to transport which um, is much more embracing of the need for really good public transport infrastructure, so it would seem like a good op opportunity. I mean, I heard Simon Bridges, a previous transport minister, talking about the fact that he was willing to look at that act for Christchurch. Um, that was on national radio a few months back. So I think that you would see cross-party support, or hopefully cross-party support for um, some di at least some dialogue around it. Especially when our bus service is entirely inside one territorial area. Um, and you notice rail there too, and GPS 2.0 is going to focus more on rail. The current GPS is about light rail for cities that they've already identified, such as Wellington and Auckland. But would you like us to be considering a rail transport system for the second, gener the second version of the, the GPS, like when we submit towards that? Look, I, I don't have the information about, about that and about the merits of it. I, personally, I think it's worth looking at, particularly the Christchurch Dunedin run. Sorry, the, well, uh, the Mosgiel Dunedin run. Yep. Um, seems like a relatively direct route, but I, I don't know the details. Even a train out of Belclutha in the morning? Sure. Mm, great, thank you. Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Kia ora, Ms McTavish. Um, you've talked about the concern you have around future capital needs to give effect to our strategic framework and also the concern around the loss of uh, revenue generating or at least potentially revenue generating assets um, to say nothing of the intergenerational uh, questions that that raises. Um, that is a solution as far as I can tell um, to keep council within its debt limits right. which as you're aware are self-imposed and somewhat arbitrary. Um, are you suggesting that those need to be considered as a way of um, forward planning our capital work over the next 10 years? Yeah, I mean, I looked, at, um, I looked at that to the degree that I could in the financial strategy. Um, it seemed that you had, you had it reduced to a table there, looking at the different um, 
uh, thresholds that might be of concern, um, but there was no corresponding discussion of of um, what they indicated. So um, in the absence of that information, and you guys will have access to it, um, but yeah, I think you need to look at all elements of that financial strategy and just make sure that you're comfortable that they're, um, they're well balanced and as prudent as they can be. Obviously, the other the other one is spending um, and just being cognizant that I'm, I'm sure that there are a whole lot of people over here that probably have got views about what you should be spending things on too. So um, yeah, so I guess that's the other the other aspect of it. No further questions. Jindy, thank you for a thoughtful and very well-informed uh, submission. Thanks for having me. Now, councillors, we've reached the uh, what was going to be our break, and we will take one. Um, but we are we've caught up a little bit of time, but we're still a quarter of an hour or so behind. So, can I suggest we just take ten minutes, and then I'll be back here at quarter past, and we'll get underway again. Right, councillors, we'll get underway again. Um, Ms Mosley, welcome. Welcome, Irene. Welcome, Bill. No, the red, that's it. Yep, that's better. Thank you for your time. Here we are again. <laughs> Um, this time we're here really to uh, answer questions around our final submission we've put in after the work we've done with um, staff and uh, councillors and basically as you'll have read we're saying somewhere along the line and it's all true this has got off the rails a little bit and we really need to get it back on the rails and have an understanding of just what this is that this project is going to look like and why, why we're doing it. So as a brief summary, I've got a PowerPoint here that I'm going to show you that just outlines where we've come from and what we're doing. Now because technology always plays up when you don't want it to, there was a couple of video clips but they're not working but I'll just um, make do without those, I'll show you one at the end. So 2014 was when the feasibility study was done and that was um, acknowledged as a good piece of work, it was a sound and robust study. Just to remind you where the site was, because again, you know, you might not be familiar with Mosgiel. At, uh, if you see the map here, you've got Gordon Road and the site. And if we zoom in, then you can see there were the four sites originally that we looked at. And uh, eventually, after considerable consultation and a couple of um, sites that we hoped we could go in, but for various reasons we couldn't, that it's been, uh, you as a council agreed some time ago that this was the site we're to look at. This is the pool, in case you haven't been in there, and it was built in the 1930s and when the town had a population of 2,500 people. It now has a population of around 15,000, 16,000 people and a catchment of about 30,000 within 10 k's. So what was put in then um, was fit for purpose and it was covered in the 1970s by the community, not by the council. That's the space we've got for the little ones in our community and I think you'll agree that it's not looking great. When you compare, and this is my video clip that's decided not to work, but I'm going to show you anyway. When I was speaking a few weeks ago, I mentioned about, is it going to go? About the other pools around the area. So if you look at Belclutha for 4,000 people, they've got... Um, They've got a facility that was new in 1970 and redone about 10 years ago. Alexandra, Cromwell, they've all got new facilities. Uh, Wanaka's about to open with a new facility and um, even further afield. They, you know, they've got far better facilities than, than Mosgill has. And even if you incorporate the city, city population, we know we're under pulled and, and I talked about that last time I was here. Now we see if we can get off that. <laughs> Now it's going to make you look at Alexandra permanently. Try again. When you look further north, and DCC uh, actually paid for us to fly up and then spend a day driving all the way back by van to look at pools from Canterbury South, 
and Rangiora, it cost 10 million about eight years ago now, but um, they've also got Kaipoi, their sort of sister city as part of Christchurch, has a similar facility. So, you know, when you're looking at this, and then the classic one, Lawrence, there's 250 people in Lawrence, and they built that a couple of years ago for $2.4 million. In August last year, council staff uh, had this report commissioned looking at uh, getting really up-to-date costings with the latest te technology that we can use for, for pools, and that is the document that we've been working on since then from. The idea of the like-for-like like and uh, uh, A, sample A on the page shows what uh, council staff asked for as being like for today's population, and uh, example B is showing what the community believe is needed for the population and the future growth that we're expecting. So when you talk about um, the core services and the baseline costs, you're, if we work off um, model A, then we're looking at a six lane pool and basically a space for doing other things. We know that that's not ideal. We've talked to pools around New Zealand and trying to incorporate hydrotherapy and learn to swim in one one pool doesn't work, it means it's not really fit for anything that people manage. Um, and, and the same with the little ones, we need that space that they can uh, learn to swim and grow. This was another video clip that's not working, but I was ready for that, so I've got stills. Hopefully it'll let me get to them. Some other innovations that have happened, pools are now having lower roofs. It saves on the heating costs. They're also having less glass. Glass is an expensive building product, but it also causes problem with the heat in, in the pool surrounds. You'll have probably all sat in a pool at some stage where it's just stinking hot on one side, and, um, and, and that's because of the amount of glass. So by reducing the amount of glass, it saves cost, it, impo it improves the thermal retention in the pool and it also is a safety factor when you get that glare on the water it's hard for the staff to see what's happening in the water and you can miss um, you know someone that's gone under and got into difficulty so these are all innovations that we were looking at through this style of pool um, and there's, there's cost savings there with that we're looking at a lap pool uh, we've said 10 lanes would be ideal that would give a 25 by 25 metre pool uh, we conceded that in December, and I mentioned that in the submission. It was really more to keep the, the project on the books than because we believe eight is ideal, but we've been prepared to work at that. We're looking at all the accessibility issues, so the pools would have ramps so anybody can get into them. Uh, you know, even you can get uh, wheelchairs that can go into the pool. Uh, looking at the other spaces, we need to cater for the whole of the community, and that's what this design is trying to do. It, it allows uh, everyone access. And this gives you an idea of the, of the leisure pool space. So I think when you can see the photos, we're not talking about um, you know, top of the line, we're talking about community-based facilities. This design is similar to what Mos uh, Wanaka is about to open this month. And it's, uh, there's one on the Kabiti Coast that I've been and had a look at as well. They're, they're effective, they're fit for purpose, they last you know, they're designed to last the 50 years plus, but they're not deluxe, practical. We've been working with staff and um, this is, sort of gives you an idea of what the, the enhancements were that the community have said they're prepared to put the funding in for. Um, we would purposely left the utilities areas out and other drawings just because it can add confusion, but this one gives you a better idea of what the complex will look like. We've put in the red dotted lines around how the 10 lanes could be put in there if the funding was available, but the, the area in the white and the blue is what we believe is really what's needed and what the community believe they are trying to fundraise for. What we're looking for is in line with the rest of New Zealand. We know that drownings are on the increase. Our children need to be able to have access to learn to swim. There's 16 schools within 10 minutes of Mosgiel. There's no indoor, all age, year round public recreational facilities in Mosgiel. There's nothing where all ages can go together and, and have fun and relax and commune as a community. And this facility would become a place where all ages can meet and interact. And that's important for part of keeping that, uh, the good feel within a community, uh, community engagement. 
To date, we've raised just over a million dollars, and I think if you consider that we don't even know exactly what this pool is going to look like yet, that's really shown just how committed the community are to this. We're getting a lot of feedback that they feel it's really unfair to have to fund half of it, and we've felt that, but again, all along, we've been positive and tried to keep focusing on what we're doing rather than getting into debates about it, but we feel we've really come to a crunch point now, and council do need to consider just what would be the right amount. If, if we walked away as a community group, what would the council be up for to replace what's there when you include all the earthworks and, and transport uh, realignments of roads and things that go into it? It, it is going to be more than 6.4 million, which is what you've got in your budget for the next three years at this stage. We've worked hard to put in um, cost savings in energy efficient, energy efficient technologies, and that's part of trying to keep the costs down. Uh, a lot of the people that we've talked to around the fundraising are looking for you guys to lead by example. In our submission, we've given uh, situations in the past where community groups have supported council, and I don't think there's an example where we, you've had to put in half. We're fully committed to what we're doing. We, we will keep working to try and raise this money, but we know it's going to be difficult. The, um, the community funders, Community Trust of Otago, they've said they're looking for council to to make a bigger commitment, that they are worried about the precedent it could set if it sits at the level it is at the moment. And the other thing I think that we need to consider really carefully as a whole city is, yes, we probably can find the whole seven and a half million, but there will be a real cost to that. Um, the Mosgill Rotary Club alone, with private donations and fundraising, has put in over 200,000. You know, that's 200,000 that's not going into all the other things they've funded in the past. Uh, normally they give 20, 30,000 a year to projects in the community. Last year they gave ukuleles to St Mary's School. They, um, you know, support kids, kids going on science fairs. We've got little ladies making jam and selling fruitcakes for the pool. Is that really how we should have to fund this thing? And that money is all money. Um, you know, I feel that last two and a half million will have an impact on other charities in the city because it comes to a point where you reach saturation and you start to have to take the money from other areas to what your normal catchment of funding would be. We're really confident about the five million. We um, are already on the, you know, got plans for that second million, and that's without any grant funding to date. And then, um, you know, from there it all just snowballs up to the five million. That last two and a half is the one that's going to be very hard. But I'm not going to say we can't do it because we'll do our absolute best. But the community are at the point where they feel that this seems um, quite odd. And we're getting questions like, um, so if Mosgiel will raise the money, if someone comes from over the hill, do they pay more to visit this facility than if, because we funded it ourselves? And you can see the sort of questions that people are asking. There's a sense that it is quite unfair. So th that's the basics of what we're doing. We've done all the OPEX and CAPEX, and, and the staff are working with all the figures. There's an irony in the fact that, as a trust, the volunteers have now been on project longer than any of the staff on council. And it's um, been really good being able to work with them and the councillors we have to try and move this forward. Thanks, Irene. Um, can I just kick off questions? Just, I just want to crystallise. So what you're basically arguing is that rather than sticking to the placeholder amount that we put in some years ago, we should be going to uh, the ba a baseline of half, uh, well, no, a baseline <laughs> of what we would be spending were we to replace the current pool with something that was up to date for the current community. So that's, in essence, your... Yep, that's exactly right. That's and right. so that's by like for like, we're saying what was built in 1935 for 2,000 people, the equivalent now is what we showed you it's, on the it's screen. It's for 16,000. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that, that's fine. I just wanted to get yep. that right down in, in simple, clear terms. Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship, and thank you, um, the two of you, for coming back again. Um, it's certainly been a common thread in the submissions we've received that there's a perception in the from submitters in, in Moscow in particular of unfairness that they're being asked to contribute um, to this development, um, which is understandable to some degree, but I have to say I'm a little uh, confused to hear it in this session um, because my recollection of how this has evolved wasn't that the council asked the community 
uh, to pay for it, but that the community offered uh, to raise money to go above and beyond what council deemed appropriate. Um, so you're expressing sympathy for that view and um, doesn't quite mesh with my recollection. So um, do you want to speak to that? Yep. Um, in 2003, the uh, recommendation from the report from the general manager was community fundraising is an option to reduce the contribution of the ratepayer and talked about previous examples of that. So it was always intended to be that that fundraising would be to add to what needed to be there as a baseline replacement. Over the last three years, I agree, it's been hijacked, and um, those reasons for that, that would be best probably not to go into, but the fact is it was always, it was always meant to be to add the value, not to build the basic bricks and mortar that was needed on the Tyree. So your understanding is that the current arrangement doesn't do that? No, you, you're not going to be able to build what would be considered like for like for 6.4 million and the staff are doing the figures on that. It's all based on those documents from August last year that Council had commissioned. Thank you. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you Irene and Bill for coming here today. Um, as you pointed out this has been not necessarily the most direct path towards the end. And you know that the council obviously has formed a committee that, that has councillors on it, you guys on it, and staff on it. Are you happy with the progress of that committee as it's moving forward? Yeah, it's been fantastic. The last since Christmas, the progress we've made and the um, you know the feeling that we're all on the same page has been fantastic. And it's really what's kept us going. And I think it's what's kept the fundraising flowing in the way it has. We were able to say publicly, look, we feel like we're on the right track. But we also know we have to be really honest, and the honesty is that this is the feedback we're getting from the community, so we're here passing it on. So, and as that committee's worked through this issue, this, this issue of um, like for like has come up and been discussed quite heavily, and this is really what you're presenting here now, is that if the council was to build, if, if it was not to build an extra facility, but just to build the appropriate like-for-like -like replacement facility that now reflects the population of Mosgill and the standard of, of facility that's built for populations of that size, this would be the facility that we would build and you are asking for us to come up with a costing of that facility and then consider that as the baseline? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Elder. Thank you for your presentation and the amount of work you put into this. Um, I was just wondering if um, we had any kind of growth projections for it, the Tyree area and Mosgill area because in fact um, should the population increase then um, you know um, that like for like. Yeah. Yeah, I can perhaps shed some light onto that. Um, just looking at the, the source of this information was the statistics uh, census. And um, if you look between 2001 census and the 2013 cens census, there's been a 14% uh, uh, increase in population in the, in the Moscow area. That is effectively the mesh blocks, including the, of the Torrey Plain. Um, it will be interesting to find the results of 2018 census, which mm. we've just come through. Um, the number of dwellings is, is very vis visual, has mm. increased uh, remarkably. So uh, that sort of um, increase, on, is, I believe, will go forward. So just thinking of future projections and, and the impact on the pool, that was yeah. a, a question I had. The other thing is, just a, it's actually an aside really, um, you have lots of retirement villages out there and a lot of retired people live out there. Understandably so, it's flat. Um, have you gone to them and asked them what they would like in a pool? I'm, that's just yeah. an aside, sorry. They've been, I spoke at Brooklands last week. We're in pretty regular contact with them. I think something else relating to that is there's two more retirement villages on the paper for Mosgill and another 500 sections, so there's no doubt about the future growth. Um, yeah, and that, this hydrotherapy pool is one of the big ones that the community are prepared to fund. It's, um, you know, there's still a question mark over the... Uh, 
physio pool in Dunedin. We don't believe that even if it stays, it's a conflict because there's room to utilise both. But if that goes, a city of over 100,000 people will have no warm water space for uh, therapy, um, you know, post-operative, post-injury and aged swimming because we know that that works well. Um, the warmer water suits them. So, yeah, we're in constant contact and, um, yeah, the they're right behind us. Yes, because I know my mum had rehabilitation yeah. in, in a pool and it's non-weight bearing, so it's very good yeah. there. And Thank that's you. the importance of having the hydrotherapy dedicated purely to that. That sits at about 35 degrees. A learn to swim is about 32. So you, if you, you know, three degrees makes a huge difference mm. if you're swimming. So if 35 is too hot for kids to be seriously learning to swim in, but 32 is too cold for people needing that recovery. Mm. Thank you for that. Irene Bell, thank you very much. Oh, Councillor Lord. Yeah, um, <coughs> excuse me. I was just going to have a question, Irene, about the uh, affordability and the predictions that you've got now and how um, has there been anything along the way since you started the project that has either potentially reduced costs? You did talk about less glass, um, so I'm just wondering what that would look like. So, what I, I mean, like a lot of those other products would would fade and wear so can you add to that and also um, in terms of pool design has there been anything i know there's talk now of stainless steel yeah. so that's a big one that has um savings for the capex building the place but it also helps the opex because you're not having to uh, empty the pool and scrub down the tiles every winter like you do with the concrete and tile pool um yeah uh, the ground source heat pumps we're looking at that other different ways of energy efficiency so that we can be state of the art but also cost effective in the opex we talked about um the operating expenses we've averaged the swims as um on 4.5 swims per head of population, we're looking at a small deficit. At 6.5 swims per population, we're at break-even point on our um, future projections. And we know Ashburton are now sitting at 12 sw swims per head of population, so we're still being quite conservative in, in that. You know, we don't want to be proven wrong. So, uh, yeah, there's definitely, this, this facility could hold its own. I was perhaps thinking less about those OPEX expenditure because, I mean, obviously every pool has to pay that, but I was meaning the capital cost. You're still yeah. confident that the capital cost? Well, I think the big one is we're sitting here still managing to say we can do this for 15 million with evidence when this has gone on for seven or eight years. You know, we keep cutting the cloth and, and stripping things back and finding ways to make savings, but if we don't do it now, We'll keep two pools for 15 million. You know, the expense. I think the, it's about eight percent a year you put on uh, on your build costs just with inflation. So it's another reason it needs to be done sooner rather than later. Councillor Vandervis. If it comes back to a cost of 15 million or 18 million or 20 million, and the council gives you an assurance that it will fund. 50% of any of those, would that help your ability to raise funds? That's an interesting question because I, I sort of thought that that would be the case, but the feedback we're getting from the community is that they just feel that it's unrealistic to ask us to do that. Um, when you think about it, the likes of ourselves, we've given personally, we pay our rates, we'll pay to go to that facility, and we're paying with our time to fundraise. Is it fair that Mosgiel has to pay four times to use this facility that someone driving over the hill from Dunedin gets to use for just the cost of the entry? And that's what it boils down to, really. And when you look at other... Um, <laughs> Look at the stadium. There was 700,000, just under 700,000 private money went into that. Uh, that doesn't include the grants. We've raised that already, more than that, as a community for Mosgiel. Um, the Regent Theatre, there was two million put in by the community for a six million project. That's not half. You know, if, if we could show our community that half is the normal, then you know we could sell it to them. But they're not seeing examples of why they should have to do that. To, to put your is it fair question the other way around, is it fair to ask the ratepayers of Dunedin to go back on an agreement that we had with Mosgiel that they would come up with 50% for a pool? Mosgiel came to us, is my understanding. Is it fair on the ratepayers of Dunedin to go back on what was an Councillor, I, think, I don't think that's a reasonable question to ask of the submitter. 
um, and they're here to make a case for um, their, their um, fundraising and I don't think it's reasonable to, for, to, to demand that they put themselves in the position of uh, the rest of the community, so I don't think that's fair. Well, one much. thing I would Given like to say the rest on of that... the community are paying for it. Yeah, one thing I would like to say on that is we are ratepayers of Dunedin, and that's, that's the bottom line. We're part of the city. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but I would also note that the people coming over the hill are paying hmm. because the, all of the ratepayers yeah. are paying too. So. That's right. Thank you very much for your submission. Thank you. I uh, appreciate it, and it's really good to have, it, have your position clarified in, in the wake of um, the, the work that the committee has done. So Thank you. Look forward to progressing it. Thank you. Ms Irving. Welcome. And you're here speaking for the Dunedin Tunnels Tra Trail Trust. Yeah. yeah, the worst name ever. <laughs> it's a real tongue twister. Um, I don't have an enormous amount to add to the written submission. Um, I think probably what I'd just like to highlight um, is I did probably what um, I'm trained to do, which is to look at how you might um, undertake your decision and looking at the various strategies that have been developed over time and how the um, Dunedin Tunnels Trail Trust um, proposal aligns with those. And I think as I work through the various strategy documents, of which there are a number, um, I think we can confidently say that our project um, aligns um, with elements of all of them um, and would assist the Council in achieving the objectives um, and uh, goals of the various aspects of strategy that the City has. Um, I mean, obviously, through the um, LTP, there is a reasonable chunk of funding that's being set aside for cycleway projects, um, and certainly um, the Trust was really um, heartened to see its project specifically mentioned. Um, from our perspective, there um, are some advantages and some more specificity around that, particularly in our ability to advocate for um, further funding from other organisations, whether it be the Regional Council or um, NZTA, in the various processes and funding rounds that um, they have to go through as well. So we're not necessarily asking for large amounts of further money from you, but really um, clear recognition of our project, which help, will help us leverage funding um, from other organisations. So I'm just happy to take questions, really. OK. Questions, Councillor Council Hawkins. Thank you, Worship. Thanks, Bridget. Um, just with regard to the two specific requests in here around feasibility and wayfinding, etc., um, how um, robust are those figures in terms of what would be required to do that work? In terms of, is it a contribution? Is that what the project cost would be? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, in, in essence, it's a contribution to the overall project. Um, we're still very much looking to develop the overall project cost and as you will have all seen um, in the news recently there's been some significant changes um, care of Kiwi Rail that are, have massive um, effects on um, the costs of our project so we're having to essentially relook at how we might build this and, and what the costs of that are and that also has an impact on how we can actually build it, whether we can have access to, um, I suppose, uh, less expensive forms of construction through using working bees and so on, um, alongside um, the Kiwi Rail alignment. So, um, probably, to, I suppose, there isn't a huge robustness to the numbers themselves, but we see them as being a, um, a good contribution to those aspects of the proposal um, as we understand them at the moment. Thank you. Councillor Vanders. I see in your submission you're still assessing the impact of the Kiwi Rail five metre decision. You say that it's going to massively affect, have massive effects on cost. Mm. Would it not be more accurate to say that in fact it threatens the viability of being able to do at least some sections of this proposal? <laughs> um, well, yes. Uh, in some ways, although in many respects the problems are engineering problems. So there will be a solution, it's just a question of, of cost and getting access to funding. Um, 
Jared um, had a meeting uh, with Kiwi Rail um, yes, or last week, and we've got another one um, coming up, and, and looking at how that uh, change affects um, the proposal. And there are um, a number of different options. Um, I think, you know, from my perspective, I think we will still be advocating with them that, um, you know, achieving five metres along the entire alignment is really unnecessary um, because, in part, it's a maintenance issue for them, in part, it's health and safety. Um, and I think there's probably a variety of ways that those issues can be managed at certain pinch points. Um, so I wouldn't concede that the project's now not viable because of that, but um, it's certainly more challenging. So given that Kiwi Rail have a fairly real concern about a flapping curtain inside a carriage destroying whatever within a five metre distance of the track, if that can't be negotiated down with Kiwi Rail, do you have any other options rather than a Trump-style wall between the railway track and, and what you're hoping to build? Um, it's really about alignment. And so it means that in some places um, we have to move down an embankment, which involves a lot of retaining and things like that, um, to get out of that five metre um, setback. Um, and in other places it would mean that we sort of we have to build up the embankment to get far enough out. There's a lot more tree clearing and things like that that would be required. So um, we're still really trying to figure out all of those things. Um, but I think there are our options and we've just got to work through all of those. So just to clarify, the options are basically moving the trail further away, alignment, rather than barrier. That's what between. we're looking at at the moment. We haven't figured out whether there are uh, simply um, we can't do it from an alignment perspective or that that's not going to work cost-wise and then looking at, well, how can we go the other way and, and overcome the health and safety challenges that Kiwi Rail have identified. And just finally, do you have any thoughts on the uh, alignment issues that might exist for existing uh, trails? And I'm thinking of the one currently that goes out to Port Chalmers. Uh, there's a, a good chunk of that that's well within five metres. Do you know what Kiwi Rail's uh, intentions are in that regard? Have you had any discussion with what is going to be done for the existing, never mind the future, rail trail? Um, I haven't had any of those discussions, so I can't really answer okay. that question for you. I'm sorry. Thank you. Councillor Lord. My question sort of been covered. It was along the same lines, but thank you. Councillor Mann. Thanks for presenting, Bridget. Um, obviously, the rail, uh, obviously the cycle trails are part of a larger network, and the city has actually managed to get into the regional land transport plan a recognition of trails throughout the Otago district. So that now that that's in the plan, we can now talk, go to the ORC and can do, deal with them. We can also deal with NZTA now. And I'm looking at this particular trail and. It's a little different from some of the others because it connects urban areas to each other. Um, and we, as of now, don't have a spending plan around trail systems that are in the urban area that are not the ones that we're currently dealing with on the roads. Would you like us to consider that, that in fact, this should be looked at under a more integrated transport scheme for the city in general? And that when a trail is inside a metropolitan area, that it be given a slightly different status perhaps than one that is out into the rural area, which may be almost argued as mostly recreational, whereas inside the urban area it can be a transport mode shift. Mm. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's where um, I suppose I went to the strategy documents that the council currently has, whether it's your spatial plan, your transport strategy, um, the energy strategy. You know, a project like this one that does provide um, a variety of opportunities for commuters, for recreational use, for access to, um, you know, a built infrastructure of heritage value. You know, this covers all of those bases. So I think um, certainly as a general proposition, I think trails that provide um, transport opportunities um, should, 
I suppose, receive the benefit of that in the recognition of your of the cycle routes within your planning. Um, but I think you know the existing framework that you have, um, the various strategy documents, um, should enable you to do that um, already without perhaps having to make a, a general um, rule, if you like, that um, that cycleways that provide transport um, opportunities uh, be treated differently. Because I think you'll get to that point using the strategy do strategy documents you currently have. It is better to get there than have a rule because then rules become another set of things to discuss. <laughs> um, but then taking that to the next level, the um, transport policies are changing dramatically and the GPS is out now and, it's, and then there's GPS 2.0 going to follow in behind. And there's obviously potential. People are saying to us, please don't spend money if you don't have to spend it. Um, there's plenty of there for getting central government funding for some of these trails. So again, are you, would you like us to be putting this into our transport um, strategy, spending strategy, so that we can, if we can go and get Wellington-based money to get this kind of stuff done, we should be going after it? Oh, absolutely. I think, I mean, we're going to go for a, <laughs> have a go at everything, because if you don't ask, you don't get. But mm -hmm. um, from, for those, I suppose, that higher order funding, um, we do need recognition um, within our local documents. So, um, you know, that's partly what our submission is about, is ensuring that there's um, adequate specificity about the importance of this project for Dunedin's strategic outcomes so that we can then rely on that to leverage funding from um, other organisations. Which is actually why we're in, we had to make sure we got in the Regional Land Transport Plan so that we actually are formally in the process so Absolutely. that we can be considered. Yep. Cool, thanks. Hi, thanks for presenting. And I was just wondering um, what your perception is. If we get that trail done, or, no, when we do, um, the um, linkages it creates as well. Just can you talk to us about that? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, it provides a link between Dunedin and Mosgiel, um, which we think um, will be utilised by commuters as well as um, people who want to recreate. I mean, the, the tunnels themselves will be something we're sure that our families will do on the weekends. But I mean, the reality is it's a 15 kilometre um, ride. So, you know, easy, certainly easily enough um, people will be able to do that to get to work. Um, I mean, I walk to work most days. It takes me 40 minutes. I would be able to bike that distance in 40 minutes. So um, I think it's absolutely viable for commuters from Mosgiel, but I think it will also provide connectivity to the other suburbs along the way, so particularly the likes of Green Island and Abbotsford, um, and make the commute from those areas easier as well. What about linkages, say, with the cycle trails um, or proposed ideas of cycle trails to Waihola and the airport? Yeah, and I think there's a really... Um, well, if you look at the New Zealand cycle trail map at the moment, um, you know, the area around Dunedin is devoid of any um, cycle trails as part of the New Zealand Cycle Trail Network. Um, we certainly think that um, this trail would help connect cyclists coming in from the Central Otago Rail Trail. Ultimately, if we can connect down into the um, Clutha Gold um, Trail, that would be fantastic. Um, and, you know, also up north into on the and along the coast. So I think there's no doubt when you look around New Zealand now since the development of the New Zealand Cycle Network, um, that, that um, form of tourism is becoming increasingly popular and off the back of that you see all sorts of benefits. If you look you know, through central Otago at the moment at um, little villages like Hyde, Lauder, um, Omakau, Ofa that have been able to develop businesses and that off the back of the rail trail and I think you know, there's enormous potential for that. Um, coming into Dunedin as a sort of end point for some of those trails and or a starting point for people moving off. So um, I think there's a lot of um, potential there. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Really appreciate it, sir. Thank you. Um, now, councillors, we've got, we have five more submissions and we are five minutes away from the, what was to be our lunch break. So not only are we keeping um, other submitters uh, quite a long time, um, but we have a very tight time constraint in terms of getting to our council. So I implore councillors to keep their questions relevant. Some of the questions are straying off into some very interesting territory, but not relevant to the submission. So, Mr McLeod, 
Good morning. I, I will be quite brief, so you should be able to get to your lunch on time. So thank you for the opportunity to address this forum in support of the South Dunedin Action Group's submission. As you have seen, the Action Group sees much good in the long-term direction Council is taking with stormwater and surge reticulation design and development and some of the other services such as the pop-up centre. The same can be said for the improvement and the maintenance of existing stormwater and sewage infrastructure and the emergency response procedures. There is, however, one major concern that occupies our thinking at this point as a community, and that is the need for action in the midterm to address the matter of sewage and stormwater problems in the Forby Corner area. We are aware that Council is looking at some short-term measures, and this has been flagged by Dr Pedrose and Tom Dwyer for release at a public meeting scheduled in June. This is a step in the right direction, but as yet, we have no details. Many people in this area, and Radius Fulton Home is very much included in this, are regularly subjected to sewage, not just entering their properties, but also entering their homes through toilet pans. This, as you will appreciate, was the reason Margaret Wade collected signatures from many unhappy residents. And we have to acknowledge that Margaret must have been very unhappy herself to undertake such an action. And she had plenty of support for it. Our issue, therefore, with the current situation is a, is a public health issue, and more of a third world city problem than one where we expect to suffer in this city. Public health encompasses not just the risk of disease from untreated human waste, which it is, but also the toll it takes on mental and potentially economic well-being. It is patently unacceptable to expect citizens of this city to live with it for the next indeterminate period while a long-term term fix is engineered. These people as with many others in the area, should not be expected to suffer the ignominy of third world services and the danger and embarrassment that may bring. The need is now, and further degradation of public health and welfare cannot be neglected in the intervening period. We are considering bringing the matter to the attention of the public health authorities, as we believe it would benefit from scrutiny from that perspective basically to either allay the public's legitimate concerns and fears or to pursue a process to attend to the matter in a more timely and permanent fashion. I have been informed that the fitting of non-returnal flat files to the Radius Fulton Home sewage system is being considered. This is good for Radius Fulton Home, but dredging through my past knowledge as a young engineer designing such systems, it will simply result in the next lowest point on the system being flooded with human waste. These people, and the city in general, deserves and has earned a better response than simply moving the problem to a new location, and we have to do better. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Um, well, thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, you'll, you'll understand, Mr. McLeod, that there are um, I'm aware of, uh, as councillors, a number of councillors are, of some discussions that are underway in terms of uh, both short and long-term solutions, some of which involve consent issues, which can't be discussed publicly. Um, can I assume that you would be happy for the city to call a meeting at its earliest convenience when those matters are clarified so that people are left under no illusion about the timing of work and what nature of work proposed? I think any communication from the city on the matter is, is really important. I think it's important to the community because they, they uh, are sitting there with a bit of unknown hanging around them in their futures, so that would be appreciated. Thank you. The, there are several issues, aren't there? Not just the one you highlight, but also the wider issue of preferred options for discussion around 
the longer term work in terms of lower areas and so on, many, many uh, proposals have been touted. Uh, and that would also necessarily be part of the discussion, or is the, is the Surrey Street issue um, the prime concern for you at the moment? Uh, I think that's an, that's an immediate concern for the community in general. It's, it's wider than Surrey Street, of course. Uh, and, and if we seek to resolve some of the uh, issues there, we, we do run the risk of just simply shifting the point of impact the next time we have a heavy rain event. Right. So we, we just I, I would like to see this see council bring bring its focus forward a bit just so we can we can shorten that time up and whatever that may take uh, would be gratefully uh, received by the by the community. So you're asking the council at, at its earliest opportunity, meaning an opportunity where it can provide useful information and current information to call a meeting and disseminate or by whatever method disseminate that information. I think it's important to disseminate the information, but I think it's important to have a timeline attached to it. Okay, thank yep. you. No further questions, Mr. McLeod. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mission. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs> thank you. Um, Ms. Davidson. Welcome. The thank next you. five minutes are yours. <laughs> yes, thank you for that heads up about the five minutes. I, I, I have timed it. If I'm lucky, it'll come in under five minutes. That's good. Well, I'll it's try. a very comprehensive um, submission, so I suggest you speak to the main points. Yes, OK, that's fine. Thank you. Um, I really congratulate the Council on the hard work and vision that have gone into this, this plan. Um, the Van Brandenburg Harbour development would be studying. And um, it was something that Peter Entwistle championed um, for Dunedin. He uh, configured Dunedin as the romantic city with the streets of Charles Kettle's street plan leading to its great buildings and down to the harbour. Uh, that's the idealised Claudian seaport. And I think you can sort of see um, that the Van Brandenburg buildings, if built, would um, sort of mesh with that with that concept. Um, however, oh well, and there's Kettle Street Plan. As you can see, there's the harbour um, basin at the bottom with the streets, Rattree Street running, oh, running straight down to it. Um, it's really nice to get sight lines from the hills down to the harbour. And I think that's something that we should keep if we can. Um, whoops. Um, I would be happier about the bridge if even one other Van Brandenburg building was certain. But will it ever get built? Um, we need something across the other side of the railway lines to lead the eye down to the harbour. Um, otherwise, I, I recommend an underpass, really. You may say flooding problems, but... Surely that's a minor hurdle compared with the other challenges of building on a recla reclaimed land. The whole, the whole vision is, is very ambitious, and I certainly don't knock it. But do we really need ratepayers to pay for something, to, you know, to, to put the first you know, stake in the ground, um, when nobody else, as far as I know, has definitively said, yes, we are going to build a Van Brandenburg building? And if it's just going to be the usual sort of mishmash of um, less stellar um, architecture, well, where's our vision? Anyway, the new projects are the icing on the cake, in my opinion, not the bedrock of urban planning. 
And in the present uncertain times, I feel we need to get the basics right first. I'm really glad the Council is upgrading our ageing water infrastructure, which will help with the threat of climate change. We're facing two other major challenges, transport and housing. If Dunedin is to be a sustainable, livable city, the Council needs to be proactive in meeting these challenges. Instead of sleepwalking towards the mess other cities are in, Dunedin could be a model for how to do things better. And that's where I would like my rates spent. We have got a big problem with straight State Highway 1 running right through the middle of the city. And it's also a major commuter route. Um, not surprisingly, cyclists don't feel safe on it. Um, it's congested, especially at peak times. And um, if you've ever tried to have a cup of coffee outside at Oaken when a um, sheep truck goes past, you'll see that it's really not great recreationally. Um, eventually, we will need to get it shifted. We need a bypass, and I think planning for that should start now. Council of Andavis wasn't impressed by the article about cycleways, cycleways I sent around, uh, and he's right, cars are comfortable, safe and dry, but they're a nightmare for a city when they're the only viable way to get around. And really, if you want to lead what most of us would regard as a normal life, um, there aren't many other good options at the moment. The DCC must be proactive about public transport. It is, although um, somebody else is providing it now, DCC is, is responsible for urban design and public transport is absolutely key to urban design. Um, the first task is a major review of transport across the board, which is probably coming up for review anyway. And public transport has to be included in that review, irrespective of who is now providing public transport. Housing. I'm really glad about the Merrill Task Force on Housing. We do have a looming housing crisis, particularly in the rental market. With the projected influx of transient labour for the hospital rebuild, you've got the perfect storm. Rents will rise if there's an undersupply of rentals, and if developers leap in to build cheap, high-density accommodation, the heritage and the character of City Rise will be at risk. And there are already some awful eyesores in City Rise. Rooms to rent. Can't you just see that extrapolated across City Rise? Um, yeah, in the warehouse precinct, we're reaping the benefits of valuing our commercial heritage architecture. Our residential heritage is the next important thing. The character of City Rise is an irreplaceable asset for visitors and residents. I've proposed a residential heritage working group. Can we create a win-win situation? Could we, for instance, pull down an old house or a group of old houses that have lost their charm and build new accommodation that would add to the character of City Rise, not degrade it. The 2GP might contain design controls on new building in City Rise, and we've advocated for that, but we've already learned in the warehouse precinct that things go better if the different stakeholders understand each other and not just do the bare minimum for compliance. And by stakeholders, I'm thinking of developers, heritage advocates, residents, council staff, and, um, and, and councillors. It worked very well in the warehouse precinct. And I'd like to see that now, uh, us now turn our attention to the challenges of residential heritage as well. So um, I'd like the council to be proactive and to invest heavily in many forms of housing, actually. Um, we need a major rethink of social housing, housing for the elderly, short-term rental accommodation, <coughs> and new concepts like co-housing. And I would like to see the money for the central city and campus upgrades to go instead to these areas. And um, having heard Irene speak so eloquently about the Mosgiel pool, I would also um, prefer, prefer that to some of the other things that you're proposing. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, councillors? Questions? Very comprehensive. I said your submission is very comprehensive.
Thank you. Thank you. My name is Nari Sutherland and I thank you for the opportunity to speak to the issue of mobility parking. There are many levels of mobility, some not quite to the level of disability. This is depending on who does the disability evaluation. Regardless, as we age, speed of mobility becomes a factor, which needs consideration as to the length of time parking is required. And at present, the city does not take this into consideration. If so, where? In the past, we have found this wonderful city a pleasure with good ambience where we could achieve our goals, shop till we drop, and enjoy the experience. No longer. It's becoming abysmal to enjoy the, endure the frustration of trying to find suitable, timely parking within reasonable proximity to access places of need. For example, shopping, medical ablutions, and the old coffee. Naturally, as time goes by, mobility slows for various reasons, mostly health, and it is difficult to retain independence, which should be nurtured, not taken away with age progression. It becomes more poignant to retain this independence. Particularly trouble spots are the dental school, the hospital north of the city, Centre City and also the exchange area, as I discovered yesterday. I realised due to building activity around the hospital and dental school and ever ongoing roadworks, work vehicles are taking up valuable space in their manner of operation. But what I wish you as decision makers to consider is making changes in the future plans to meet this void. I would suggest to our parking, particularly be made available from the Octagon to Albany Street, including the fringes. I would suggest intermittent parks be made available within these said areas with a colour coding asphalt, for instance, a red or an orange, with a two hour time limit for both disabled and 75 years plus permits only. I note whilst visiting the university recently quite an unusual painted road crossing. It really stood out and the traffic responded. A recent incident has prompted me to speak out. I was and often do assist a friend who has had major surgery and is in recovery. She wishes to maintain her independence and mobility and rightly so. As I am the driver, I found the only available park in close proximity to our destination, not realising it was a one hour park, as further along it is two hours, and they were all taken as it happened. We proceeded snail's pace from A to B. Unfortunately, the appointment was late. Mother Nature intervenes, close to lunchtime, we grab a quick coffee. Needed a breather as my friend suffers from shortness of breath on exertion. On return, you've guessed it, I got a parking ticket. So sad as the 75 years permit was displayed, so I felt there was no empathy from the enforcement officer. I wrote in, as offered by letter, with a very valid explanation. Received from customer services, not parking, not one bit of consideration and no responses to the points I raised. So I rewrote to clarify validity of the points raised to again receive another ignorant letter from customer services, totally avoiding my valid points. I wonder if these people on frontline have feelings, thoughts, or understanding the plight of the elderly or don't give a toss for the nanny state. Just pay up or else. It almost shows signs of being a totalitarian approach. There definitely needs to be a change of attitude in some respect. Please give consideration to the points I've raised so as we can all mingle together generation with generation and enjoy our city. We are also ratepayers and have been for the past 50 years. 
Thank you for the free parking and disability permits, and I do hope the media report is correct in reporting the Mayor said it was a council cock-up and no charges would apply. I totally agree with Mrs Jo Miller's report in the ODT. Let us get alongside Napier City Council and embrace making this city more accessible for senior residents. And just a PS, because I'm probably up to time. Many times I've overpaid and I don't ask for a refund and I don't even give that consideration. So a lot of revenue will be gathered in this way. I think it's called swings and roundabouts and if you increase the car parks, you'll increase the revenue. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you so much for that presentation. I too was looking for a mobility park yesterday to take a family member to a, a really important appointment and I do understand how difficult it is. Um, I wanted to ask you around if you think this confusion about the different kinds of mobility uh, permits. So we've got the 75 plus, it's run by council, we've got the CCS permit. Would you say there's a bit of confusion out there? Well, some people don't quite qualify for a disability permit, but yet they are unable, because of health issues, able to get from like, you know, I mean, I've talked with friends about that, and say, well, why didn't you park in the car park? Well, that's not possible to walk that no. distance to where you're going. It is a difficult issue. It is a it? difficult mm. issue. So my suggestion of just a few colour-coded ones, at least they go, oh, oh, what's that? Whereas often people, if it's just a sign up somewhere, don't even really look. So if there's a colour coding, coloured on the ground, people would stop and say, oh, oh, perhaps I don't park there. It's for a purpose. In terms of mobility parks, would you say that, that often people yes. are not sure where they are? It's parking review that's coming up. Yes, I know. I'm yeah. just asking for clarification. Pardon? Um, it's, it's okay. It's okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm just wondering if your notes could be kept, please, and we'll put them into the parking review, which has just been advertised yesterday, I understand. So if that would be helpful, because it's probably more appropriate in there, if that's okay. Yes. Can I actually Oh, okay. Thank you very much for your submission. Thank you. Anderson. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Um, I, it's interesting coming on the back of those um, previous... You'll need to bring that mic a little closer to you because it's hard to... Quite, <laughs> you have quite a soft voice. Um, thank you. Is that, is that better, sir? Yeah, that's better. Right, let's rock. Next five minutes are yours, so far away. Okay, so the environmental, the health and wellbeing, um, the community engagement, those issues are all important, probably bigger, um, more wide-rangingly important, uh, that I kind of touched on in my submission. I'm just here to deal with uh, three points, uh, because on the, behind that, we need to support that with sound thinking based on solid financial management. So the first, uh, I, I'm making three points and I'm not here to ask for more. I'm just asking that we use what we have got wisely, which is fairly much confirmed by the surreptitious amendments I referred to around Christmas of last uh, this year. That really puts a spotlight on your other statutory obligation to provide for our recreational needs, dog owner recreational needs, not dog exercise needs, our recreational needs. And I don't know how you're bringing Swampy into the middle of the city so we can wander around that all day uh, on the weekends. But um, statutory reports saying department in, uh, to the Department of Internal Affairs are saying dog parks are adequate. The photographic record suggests that's not the case. None of them can be entered by people using mobility devices. Trees drop berries that make dogs ill. I wish I was joking, standing beside a tree where the branch finally fell off because of lack of attention. Designed equipment by design to be unsafe. Trip hazards, poke hazards. That's a gate. You saw the broken down fencing in uh, the picture. Broken down plastic fencing. We know the official reports are saying every dog park has a human shelter and we have the photographic evidence that says they don't. 
The facilities are unsafe, <coughs> below minimum statutory standards for safety. They are decrepit. Um, that's before we ask if they meet the recreational needs of dog owners. To correct this point three, I'm just asking that you begin doing what you're statutorily obliged to do. Not asking for more, just our minimum rights. Find out where the money is. Get a hold of the money. Please stop putting me in rooms where I am told dog owners aren't entitled to their minimum human rights. I do have the same right to be safe and not be dodging falling tree branches, although that wasn't personally me, as everybody else. Please make sound decisions. And excuse me, I'm going to have to find a handkerchief. Previously, there was a preoccupation with extremely expensive stainless steel poop bag dispensers. I just want to deviate slightly there. Now it seems small dog parks. On your figures to the Department of Internal Affairs, 2,000 out of over 17,000 dogs. There are plans to spend money building a third one. Three dog parks purpose designed for over 10 under 10% of the dog population while the rest of people, and I wish I was joking, but it only happened two weeks ago, are dodging falling branches from un, uh, maintained old trees and broken down plastic netting. That's not sound in uh, money management, it's not sound planning, the return on the investment is even worse than the expense of stainless steel poop bag dispensers, although they had the magical quality of disappearing without a trace, which presumably made them worth their price. Ms. So Ms. My final Ms. Anderson, you might want to come to a conclusion now because your five minutes has been expended. Thank you, sir. Four lines. Make a 10-year plan based on sound decisions. It's not hard, it's not complex. It could be project managed on half a time, half a half a half time. My final sentence is find out where the money is because you've probably got around twenty million dollars. That's actually adequate. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any questions? The Rana, thank you very much for your submission, Ms Anderson. And for your brief. Thank you. The councillors, that's the Last of the submissions. Uh, it is now uh, 35 minutes away from the scheduled time for the start of the council meeting. Captain Sandy, what's the latest we can start the council meeting under the current? Sorry? I'm not going to rush this council from, from four hours sitting here to four or five or six hours sitting there without a reasonable break. I think our, con our concerns are just as important as the submitters, frankly. All right. Um, I've made a call. Um, we will start the council meeting at 1.30. All right? 1.30. We will start the council meeting. And lunch is in the Otaru room.